Well, good morning. It being uh, just after nine o'clock, I declare open this meeting of the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. The Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure for 2021 and 2022 for the portfolios of agriculture, water and environment, industry, science, energy and resources, and infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it even if no additional appropriations have been sought. The committee is due to report to the Senate on Tuesday, the 14th of July, 2021, and it is set Friday, the 9th of July, 2021, as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. The committee's proceedings today will continue its examination of the communications and arts outcomes of the infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications portfolio. I wish to remind senators and witnesses that we continue to operate in a COVID safe environment which puts limits on the number of people allowed in the room. Senators, departments <coughs> and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure that these budget estimates are conducted in a safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat if required. The committee will be conducting today's hearing in person. Uh, some witnesses will be attending via video conference. Thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues we have along the way. Uh, understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. Officers and senators are familiar with the rules of the Senate governing estimates hearings. If you need assistance, the Secretariat has copies of the rules. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It's unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purposes of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations to the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. The Senate has resolved also that an officer of a Department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. I draw the attention of witnesses, particularly to an order of the Senate of 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim that an uh, information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. Officers called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their full name and position for the Hansard record and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphones and if people could please turn their mobile phones to off or to silent. I welcome back Senator the Honourable Jane Hume, Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy and Minister for Women's Economic Security, representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and Arts and Portfolio Officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. I also welcome Mr Stephen Rue, Chief Executive Officer of the MBNCO. Uh, Ms Dyer, I thank you, given what's happening in Melbourne, for making the effort to come and join us today. It is a substantial body of evidence and uh, your presence here in person is appreciated. Mr Rue, do you have an opening statement? I, I do, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, Senators. Um, as you just mentioned, with me today is our Chief Operating Officer, Catherine Dyer. I'd also like to thank her for um, coming uh, to us today from Melbourne. We have our Chief Customer Officer, Brad Wickham, who's sitting behind Catherine, and we have our Chief Engineering Officer to my left, to your right, Senators, John Parkin. Um, I know the committee requested specifically that Philip Knox, our Chief Financial Officer, appear. Um, unfortunately, he's recovering from an accident um, whereby he um, broke his shoulder of falling from a bike, so unfortunately he's not able to be here today. Um, finally, I want to acknowledge Oh, sorry, firstly, I want to acknowledge that today marks the start of National Reconciliation Week, 
and it's great to be part of an organisation that engages and connects with First Nations, peoples, cultures and communities. NBN Co has had a vital role to play in driving digital capability and importantly connecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And it's just one example we were able to do this successfully for more than 50 First Nations communities isolated at the height of the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. We're also committed to supporting employment opportunities for First Nations people and will continue to build on our commercial relationships with First Nations owned businesses and suppliers. The people of NBN Co have worked hard to build our nation's digital backbone and continue to evolve the product offering and improve our customer service to support Australia's long-term prosperity. In February this year, we reached our biggest milestone yet, connecting 8 million homes and businesses to <coughs> NBN. And as we move away from a construction focus to being a customer-led service organisation, we continue to invest in the network and in product solutions. Last year, we were able to announce continued network upgrades and further plans to make our highest wholesale speed tiers available across the nation. By 2023, our highest wholesale speed plans will be available to up to 75% of premises in the fixed line footprint. This work is already underway with the announcements of the suburbs and towns representing 1.1 million homes and businesses set to benefit from the expansion, extension of fibre deeper into the communities. We're also seeing strong demand for our highest speed tiers, more than 1.4 million customers on speed tiers of 100 megabits per second and above. And that all points to very strong progress the company is making. But today I also want to address several critical issues that I know will be of interest to you. Firstly, you will have seen some media reports around issues arising from our new field service management system known as Unify. Unify was designed to address issues like missed appointments or work not being completed right the first time and getting better information to retailers about technician location. We launched Unify in Victoria and South Australia before taking it to other states. Unfortunately, upon launching in New South Wales, some technicians have experienced reduced productivity schedules and work allocations, resulting in longer wait times for connect and assure appointments. And there have no doubt been some bugs in the system. But as problems have been identified, our staff have worked diligently to manage these issues to improve performance and establish an ideal future operating state. We have shared with our retail service providers a plan that, that has us returning to the wholesale broadband agreement performance levels by the end of June this year. Over recent weeks, MBN have met with the Communications, Electrical and Plumbing Union of Australia and delivery partners to resolve industrial concerns with a view to improving the experience for technicians and customers alike. We will continue to work with our delivery partners and the wider industry to resolve any emerging issues as we embed this new system. And Catherine can go into more detail later about our recovery plan. I mentioned at the last hearing that we had identified an issue with a component in some fibre to the curb, network connection devices, or as we call them, NCDs, that fail when subjected to certain rare conditions. In areas that get a lot of electrical storms and which have high resistance to earth due to geology and where FTTC is a technology, the devices can be affected by nearby lightning strikes. As I said last hearing, this is a complex electrical issue. When lightning hits the ground, it creates a voltage difference between premises connected through copper lines to a central distribution point. In some instances, when the voltage difference is high enough, the NBN, the NBN devices will fail, and this causes the broadband connection to be lost. It's very important to emphasize that throughout this process, safety has been our foremost concern. Testing by our supplier confirms that the devices fail in a safe way. I would like to further confirm that these devices meet the relevant Australian standards associated with this equipment. Nothing we have seen in the devices that have come back to us or that we have seen in the field indicate that this assessment is wrong. Investigations have found that in some instances a component in the device does not meet our design specifications and while these devices are failing in a safe way, it is happening more often than expected in selected areas causing a reliability issue for some customers. This is one important reason why over the last storm season we have seen higher failure rates in FTTC devices in locations such as the Blue Mountains. In these areas, when a device does fail due to electrical overstress, we are now replacing it with an NCD that meets our original design specifications and is much less likely to fail again under similar circumstances. Approximately 500,000 devices with the component issue were de deployed into the network as the issue coincided with our peak FTTC deployment period. 
Again, and very importantly, for the vast majority of homes in the FTTC footprint, this component issue has no day-to-day -day impact on their NBN service. In fact, we believe that only around 4% of the FTTC footprint of 1.5 million premises are in the highest risk areas. In these areas, many devices have already been replaced, and in other areas it may never be an issue. We are working with our supplier looking into root causes, but of course our initial focus has been on ensuring the devices are safe. We have now focused on rapidly detecting devices that fail and implementing a fast-track solution that aims to ship a replacement device directly to customers within 24 hours. We understand the inconvenience this issue is causing to customers in a small number of affected areas, and we are working with our suppliers, retail and delivery partners to minimise the impact as quickly as possible. And as I said earlier, we have John Parkin with us today who I've asked to appear to ask any technical questions the committee may, may have. As I mentioned at our last appearance, a significant turning point occurred last year when we completed the initial rollout and we started raising private debt to replace government debt. In April this year, NBN secured more than two and a half billion through our first ever bond issue in the US debt markets. This investment in one of Australia's largest infrastructure projects shows that the international markets are watching. They support the work of NBN to date and have confidence in where we are going. This investment is testament to the hard work to reach rollout completion and NBN's vision to accelerate our evolution and operate as a highly efficient wholesaler. Our continuing strong performance is further supported by our fiscal 21 quarter three results. What we achieved during the pandemic as an organisation and as part of the telecommunication industry is appreciated and recognised. Earlier this year, we released our Pricing Review 2021 consultation paper, incorporating comprehensive industry feedback and wide-ranging discussions regarding potential pricing models. The proposals we put forward in the consultation paper demonstrated that we have taken decisive action to respond to the main areas of industry feedback, cost certainty in our two-year pricing roadmap, and requests to fast-track long-term pricing reform. We are committed to progressing long-term wholesale pricing reform through a special access undertaking variation process with the Australian Competition Consumer Commission. We agree that this is a logical next step to implement future changes to the pricing construct as soon as possible. Our plan is to provide a discussion paper to industry outlining the key elements of our proposed approach to the special access undertaking variation next month. This discussion paper will contain the modelling that gives retailers the data they need to make an informed contribution to the pricing consultation process. And again, Senators, if you have any detailed questions on this, Brad Wickham is here today to assist. So finally, the last 12 months have been like no other, not only for NBN Co, but for the whole country. We saw our nation rely on broadband like never before, and NBN was able to deliver. We look forward to the next phase of our evolution, where NBN will continuing will continue delivering on our purpose and enabling Australia's digital future. So, Chair, with that, my team and I are very happy to take your questions or those of your colleagues on the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rui. Before we do proceed to questions, just check with members of the committee that there's no objections to uh, the media taking photographs in the normal way. Thank you. Uh, in that case, who's looking to lead off? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. Rue, for your opening statement and um, for your team being here Morning, as well, and pass on our best um, to Mr. Knox. Thank you. Um, just on from your thank you for your opening statement. Can I just ask you on the debt raising? Yep. Was it oversubscribed? Um, yes, Senator. The way it works is that you um, uh, you basically go into the market. You open up the opportunity. You open up the sort of price ranges you're you're looking for. The what's called the tenor or the length of the debt, so five years, no, seven years, ten years. And what Mr. happens, Mr. Rio, I understand what, about what, debt what <clears throat> Senator, I was just explaining that. What happens is you then get, if you like, bids against that. So yes, Senator, the, there was more available debt um, to us, but it would have been at a higher price point. So we chose to um, go with the level of debt that we had. Thank you. Um, could I ask also, thank you for that. Um, could I ask you just about, um, you will have noticed this story yesterday, just on um, the bonuses. Actually, first I'll go to Minister Hume. Minister, you're aware that those NBN bonuses are taxpayers' money? I am aware that this is a government-owned um, entity and that 
decisions around enterprise agreements, employment contracts and commercial arrangements are entirely up to NBN. Yes, but it's taxpayers' money. The and, government that's an and, that, and that bonus scheme is, is, that bonus say scheme about is an arrangement that's Senator been inherited Brack. from Labor. Sorry, sorry, Senator Hume. I said, and that bonus scheme is an, inher is an arrangement that we inherited from Labor. And, but it's taxpayers' money. It's a government owned entity. It's taxpayers' money. It's a government owned entity. Yes or no, taxpayers' it's money. It's a government owned entity. So it's yes to taxpayers' money. It's owned by the government. Um, so the cost of the NBN has gone from an original promise by the coalition of 29.5 billion to 41 billion to 49 billion to 51 billion. After all those cost increases, it turned out the network hasn't really been up to scratch, and we've seen that particularly the last few estimates. And the backflip to fibre has occurred. Now the cost blown, has blown out to 57 billion. Does the government really support $77 million in bonus payments? The government acknowledges that NBN staff are employed under a range of employment, enterprise agreements, employment contracts and other commercial arrangements. This is an arrangement that we inherited from Labor. Decisions about employer remuneration are up to NBN. So you support them? Well, we also acknowledge that there's a need to very carefully consider performance payments arrangements in the public sector to ensure that they meet both the public and the government's expectations for value, accountability and transparency. So that's why in November 2020, Assistant Minister Ben Morton announced a review of performance bonuses arrangements for senior executive service and equivalent employees for the Commonwealth public sector. And that's to be conducted by the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Australian public sector. Commissioner and the Secretary of the Department of Finance. And it's the expectation of government that where agencies have access to bonus arrangements, they should exercise restraint to the furthest extent in possible, as possible in keeping with community expectations. So the government may end up not supporting the $77 million in bonus payments? Well, the review will inform the development of a consistent set of principles based, uh, a principles-based approach to the payment of bonuses across all government agencies, providing clear guidance to the boards and accountable authorities of Commonwealth entities and companies. Um, I mean, this is all in the context that the NBN ran a $7.4 billion cash flow loss in FY 2020. It was $1.3 billion larger than expected. This wasn't in the annual, in the, in the, it wasn't in the corporate plan uh, at the time when Minister Fletcher gave a speech at the National Press Club. Gen I mean, the government supports transparency, doesn't it? Well, that's why an interim report was published on the Australian Public Service Commission website on the 25th of March, 2021. But not when and that notice. final report will be expected to be finalised in the coming weeks. Commonwealth agencies have been consulted throughout the entire process. Mm. So the Prime Minister was shocked by, you know, rewards being given to Australia Post executives. Was Is he also shocked at these bonus payments? Well, there's no comparison between workers being paid in accordance with their employment conditions and the discretionary purchases <coughs> of luxury items, which the Maddox investigation found was inconsistent with the obligation imposed by the Public Governance Performance Accountability Act of 2013 relating to the proper use and management of public resources. But Minister Fletcher indicated to the Australia Post Board that they shouldn't be paying bonuses in a pandemic. These $77 million in bonuses were paid during a pandemic. Isn't there, you know, shouldn't there be some consistency? Well, we know that if certain targets are met by workers, the workers can be paid that at-risk component of their remuneration, which is a short-term incentive or STI under their employment agreement, and that's part of existing contractual relations. Mm. <clears throat> Mr. Rue, are you putting in a submission to Minister Morton's inquiry into bonus uh, payments? Um, yes, Senator, we, we were um, given a consultation paper, which we have responded to, yes. And what, how did you respond? Okay, um, are you I, able to table that? Um, I'll, have to, I'll take that on notice, Senator. Okay. If I don't, because I don't know the answer, so I'll take that on notice. Um, uh, Senator, ba basically, we, the, the principles within the, um, yeah, within the consultation paper, um, we do support. And the, the, the fact that um, NBN is a Commonwealth-owned entity, that, that there should be Good governance processes around um, uh, around remuneration of employees. The fact that there should be transparency of those uh, remuneration processes, <clears throat> and 
uh, the, the general principles of community expectation exists in a uh, in, in listed companies as well as obviously even more so, Sandra, in a, in a government business enterprise. Um, what, I, what I would say though is, is that there is, there is a difference between a bonus payment and an at-risk payment. And the reason for that is because an employee will have a particular remuneration, but some of that is put at risk. It's not as if they have a salary and then something, a, a bonus per se, comes on top of that. There is a particular remuneration and then depending upon the performance of the company against board driven um, targets which are typically a, a range of targets or what's called a balanced scorecard in, in uh, business speak. Um, performance against that by the company and a performance of an individual. So it is an at-risk pay rather than a bonus. Okay, there is I a difference. I understand that. So, so Senator, the, the answer to your question is are we, we, um, we support um, you know, the general principles that was um, presented in the consultation paper. So if, so in, th in the at-risk component of an employment package, how do you explain executives receiving in total $77 million in bonuses when you ran a $7.4 billion cash flow loss? Well, well, Senator, firstly, that actually is in the annual report, um, but, but the, the, um, the, the company is uh, investing still in its growth. So it's at a particular phase of the organisation whereby it has a particular level of revenue streams, but it also has a particular level of capital expenditure still. Um, and the, the, the cash flow loss, as you say, is, could, could be looked at as a different way, as an investment by the company into the into broadband services, which are crucial for the, for the economic welfare of the nation and for the societal welfare of the nation, and indeed for Australians' competitiveness internationally. So rather than look at that as a cash flow loss, it, it, you would never start a company, Senator, if you just looked at cash flow losses. This is an investment into the future of effectively broadband so, infrastructure in the nation. But it was $1.3 billion larger than you thought it was going to be. Well, but, but Senator, that's because of the reasons that were laid out in the corporate plan, whereby there were additional, there was additional investment made that year for a range of things. So, so Senator, break that down, that 1.3. 700 million of that is additional capital expenditure. And that is, that is really around a topic I know you're interested in, which is, which, which Catherine can talk at length about if you wish, but is the additional premises that we built during 2020 and the additional connections that we made during 2020. And that has a capital impact, but it's also building the future of the company. So it's a good thing. Um, we had more connections. So because of that, you have higher subscriber payments. That was about 100 million. And then, then there's a series of, of cash flow. The, the other half a billion is purely cash flow. It is purely timing of things like when we paid creditors, we've had a higher inventory balance than we, than we balanced, but then we budgeted for I'm glad we did because because when COVID came, we had, we had inventory on hand. Um, so, Senator, 500 million, that's just timing, and the, the rest is further investment into the into NBN's infrastructure. So, so, so I don't, I'd encourage you not to look Mr. at the cash Ray, flows. cash flow Sorry. loss was not in your corporate plan, was it? The, the cash flow, Senator, is in the annual report, which was actually, which was actually published, I, I but believe. But it wasn't in your corporate plan, it, even though it was published in all prior corporate plans. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. It is, in, it is in the annual report, and it's not. It, the, the reason, Senator, is that we, as, as we finished the end of the build program, we looked at the relevant metrics for an operating company going forward, and it was our judgment that the ones in the um, corporate plan, or the, where the, at the time, were the correct metrics going forward for us to talk about. It, it was in the annual report, Senator. It was not something that was hidden. Um, how much of your Salary. Well, what component or percentage of your employment, your remuneration package was at risk? Last, me, yes. me personally. Yeah. Um, so the, the the way that my um, and this is on the public record, the way my salary is effectively um, a third of that is at risk, Senator. So, so I may you, I may it, not your receive. Your salary is one point. I can't, is it the, 1. The, the the fixed component. It's actually, Senator. Can I? Can I, have you got an annual report? Uh, I we can get you one. Hang on, we might, we might have one over here. Um, so if you, sorry, Senator, do you, can we get, 
If we've got one, no, we've, we've got, got one. one. No, we've... Thank you. See? What page are you on? Eight, uh, 99, Sandra. Mr. Rue, I might have to take you up on your kind offer. Oh, hang on. That's right. On page 99, Senator, there's a table. Um, it's, in the, it's in the remuneration report, which is a report of the remuneration committee, which is a, which is a subcommittee of the board, mm. that's published in our annual report and has been, <coughs> I believe, has been since the start of the company, actually, who's 2010. On the, who's on the remuneration committee? Um, and is that its full name? Is it remuneration and audit, or is it just remuneration? It's, it's the remuneration committee. Okay. And who's on that? Um, so on that is our chairman, um, Dr. Spokalski. Yes. So sorry, it's called the uh, sorry, Senator. It's called the People and Remuneration Committee. People and Remuneration. Um, so on that on that committee is Dr. Spokalski, um, uh, who is the chair, um, Mr. Michael Malone, Mr. Drew Clark, and Miss Kate McKenzie. Sorry, Miss. Uh, Kate McKenzie. Um, and I'm sure it's in the annual report, Senator, if I can... Um, yes, it Actually, actually it. Senator, if you have a look at page 75... Great. You'll, you'll see you. in the right-hand column, you'll see the, the number of meetings and the names of the various individuals. Now, you can see that Shirley, Shirley Infeld was on the committee, but she moved off during the year, as did Mr Justin Milne when he left the board. Um, but the remainder is um, uh, Mr. Michael Malone, Kate and, McKenzie, and, did um, that Sukowski. and although I'm there, Senator, I appear not as a member of the committee. I, 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 I attend. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Rue, what was that? You are. <coughs> sorry, although I'm down as attending the committee, Senator, I attended in my capacity as, as chief executive, yeah. not my capacity as director. I'm not a member of the committee. Okay. And was it that the People and Remuneration Committee that approved? Do they have any role in approving the bonus payments? Um, they, what they do is they um, review uh, a range of remuneration issues and people issues, and yes, they, they are the ones who recommend the, um, uh, the pool of the short-term incentive to the board, and, and then, then the board actually okay. then will, will, will take that. And is that for all bonus payments, or is it just for executive, executive um, level? So the, so the way it works, Senator, is that there is, there is um, what I called earlier a balanced scorecard. Um, so in 2020, um, it was a range of metrics. Um, uh, um, NBN controlled, it's, sorry, it's in the report. Why am I? Um, if you go to page, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump around here if I can find no, it. But yes, I mean, yes, Sandra. If you go to page ninety-two, please. Mm. Um, if you see, if you see on page ninety-two, and th this is sort of corporate best practice how this is laid out. So you have the, the purpose of the organisation, you have its strategic imperatives, and then you have the, the at-risk components that are related to um, uh, meeting the strategic imperatives so as to hit the purpose of the company. Yeah. So you can see in twenty twenty, there's NBN controlled end user experience customer advocacy, premises ready to connect, premises active and EBITDA or earnings before interest and tax, depreciation, amortisation before subscriber costs. They were the, they were the five metrics. Um, the, uh, so what the board does is it looks at the performance of the company against those metrics mm -hmm. and then it assigns a pool. So a pool is yes. the, the total amount. So now, those, now, and to be clear, Senator, the, the numbers you're talking about is spread over almost 4,000 employees, mm. so this, but, this but goes through people, the whole company. But, I mean, the staff, 179 staff on less than $100,000 yep. received a far lower bonus than those that are at a well, much higher remuneration level. Again, Senator, it's not a bonus, it's an at-risk salary. So if you, have, if you have a lower level of income by default, the amount that you actually put at risk mm. will be lower. It's but, not a... It's not a bonus, it's, a, it's a, yeah. a part of your salary that is deferred subject to the performance well, of the company and, your, and you as an individual. Yes, and what I'm suggesting to you, given, and what I would like to know, yep. is did the, the People and Remuneration Committee consider the fact 
that the rest of Australia was in a pandemic, they still paid those. The minister, your, the so, minister, Minister Fletcher, um, was you know alarmed that Australia, the Australia Post board, uh, was pay, was considering paying bonuses, but yet here, seventy seven million dollars was paid out. The Australia Post was. You know, I mean, I hate to say it was merely seven million dollars. So yeah, to I'm, their senior executive team, I'm, I'm, and I, I take you that th this is obviously a larger number of people than the eight people who were going to share in seven million dollars. The minister put a stop to that quite rightly, I think. But here we've got another entity under his purview, and they're paying out seventy-seven million dollars so, so during San a pandemic when most some Australians lost their jobs. So, Senator. Um, I that's a that. Question. So my question is: Did the people and remuneration committee did they consider the fact that Australia was in a pandemic when they were considering paying out seventy-seven million dollars? So Senator, I'm, I, I hate to say this, I'm sorry, but that's that's actually a question for the chairman of the remuneration committee. It's not a question for me. But you've been not, attending. No, I was asked to leave during that discussion, Senator. So, but can I can I uh, can I? If, if I could refer you, though... No, but so you will have been at the meeting and you will have known, known whether there was consideration given, I, given to I the I was fact. asked to leave at that period of time, but can, can I... Can, which is appropriate, by the Do way. Do you have the minutes? Can we have the minutes? Can um, you take Senator, the minutes? I have, again, I'll have to take that on notice, if you don't mind. But, but what I, can, I, can I please um, uh, uh, refer you to the evidence of the chairman who was here at the last committee? And I think... Senator Green, I think it was you, one of you, anyway, I asked him exactly that question and I think he responded. I don't think it was exactly that question. Well, it wasn't that question. Okay. And then we'll go we'll back, go and back look to at the hand side. side. But. If, you, if you could, please, Senator. And um, could you take on notice whether um, you could provide of the course. minutes of those meetings? Of, of course. I'd like to, Mr. Rue, to read you out some correspondence, and unfortunately, this is um, this is not the only piece of correspondence to this effect that I've received. Um, so, <coughs> dear Senator Kitching, I live in Brunswick, East Victoria. So, sorry, Sandra, I, I can't hear you. Oh. Apologies. So, this is some correspondence from um, perhaps someone who would like to be to have the MBN but hasn't. Um, dear Senator Kitching, I live in Brunswick, East Victoria, and I am contacting you to seek your assistance as a Senator for Victoria with issues connecting to the NBN. I waited six weeks to get an appointment to get a connection to the NBN. I took half a day off work for the NBN connection appointment as they advised I needed to be home from 1pm to 5pm. Two days before the appointment, NBN contacted my service provider and said that my appointment was on hold and then they cancelled it the day before and can't advise when they will be able to reschedule an appointment. My service provider says this could take days, weeks or months. I raised a complaint with NBN through my service provider and they closed the complaint within half an hour. I have heard of two people I know facing similar issues with one of my friends saying NBN is not taking appointments. It has been a very frustrating experience because I can't get any other type of internet connection at home except mobile 3G slash 4G which is expensive. I have had to buy two modems, one for NBN and another for mobile, which has cost me $500. I moved to this house from a house which had ADSL. I have been working from home and I work in financial services and the internet is an essential service. Living less than 10 kilometres from the CBD of Melbourne, Australia's second biggest city and an important part of the economy, I would appreciate your advocacy in improving the situation about connecting to the NBN. You might have to take this on notice. How many technician appointments have NBN cancelled in the past month? Um, Senator, can I, can, I, can I just check two things? Did, did you say during that that the individual service is now up and running? No, it's not. I, I thought you said that it, during that... that no, was... no, I think this person would like to be a client of the NBNs but okay. isn't because so, their appointments keep getting cancelled. So if you could... If you could... And this isn't the only letter. No, I understand. But if you have that or if you have another correspondent, can you please give it to us after the hearing, please? Um, in relation to your other question, um, Catherine, would you like to address that? Please? Sure. Without uh, understanding... The sorry, what was the date? Um, I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Um, I'll get you the exact date. Was, I, it, was it this month? 
Six uh, months, it would have been the last couple of months, Okay, yes. thank you. Mm. So without understanding, I, I guess, the specific technology of the area, what it sounds like to me is potentially that customer is in a HFC area. Uh, so MBN has spoken publicly about a chipset shortage, which essentially goes into the network termination devices. And unfortunately, uh, with this worldwide chipset uh, shortage, we have had to restrict the supply of our NTDs to assurance-based activities to protect uh, the base of the network. Uh, so what is happening there? We will be announcing uh, you know, in the coming weeks about the reconnect program for HFC, but without understanding the underlying technology, that's what it sounds like to me has unfortunately played out for so that customer. We did check and it would appear they're fibre to the node. Okay. okay. Well, uh, that should not be playing out and they should not be having multiple, uh, I guess, cancelled appointments and they should be able to connect. So if you are able to give us the specific premises yeah, details, I'm more than happy to uh, mm -hmm. review that for you. I mean, how common is it that technician appointments get cancelled? Mm. Uh, so our, um, our mean time to connect and the way that we connect our customers has been impacted over the last few weeks with the implementation of Unify, which I think um, mm. Mr Roo mentioned at the start. But prior to the implementation in New South Wales, our connection timeframes, our appointment timeframes, the, the average range was between nine to 12 days. That's a typical connection wait time, if you like, across all of our technology bases. Um, yeah, so that is and very I'm actually, unusual. I'm actually looking now at a, at a um, you know, your connection maps that you provide, and it is fibre to the node. So I wasn't. This is obviously not in New South Wales. This is in Victoria. Brunswick East yeah. in Victoria. So have you got any Victorian issues as well? I'm, I'm just very curious because the time frame you're talking about is uh, what we call pre the implementation of our new uh, systems. Uh, FTTN in a metro area, we don't have constrained technicians in those areas. So I'm, I'm, what's I really what's a constrained technician. So that, therefore, if um, so, for example, as we've settled the contract in New South Wales and we've uplifted our, uh, I guess, our technician capacity and our boots on ground, we had a constraint. We had more appointments requested than we had available staff. So therefore, we built up a bit of a, uh, work, uh, I guess, a work in progress queue, which we're now allocating how, out and working through. How long is the working in progress queue? I mean, how many people are on that? Okay, so we have uh, our, we, ha we carry a normal, what I would call business as usual uh, work in progress queue. So currently for connections nationally, we're about 20,000 above what we normally op operate in a BAU environment. That has been coming down over the last two weeks, uh, which, uh, and as Mr. Roo said in his opening statement, we are expecting that to be fully back to BAU by the end of June at the latest. So, when you, so it's 20,000, what's, so what's the figure? It is, it, it is it, I think it's 21,300 so, when I looked at it last night. Okay, so normally it's about 1,300. No, so we, we have a concept. I think you, did you say it was 20,000 higher than... That's than right, so they, they've got a longer connection time. So they can get appointments, but they're uh, typically seeing, any, rather than that uh, average time frame I quoted before, they're seeing uh, typically seeing a longer wait time. That wait time is coming down. We're typically seeing an average now of about 17 days for those, uh, those ones that we, where we have had technician con capacity constraints. Have, so you given, have you given me a figure for how many technician appointments have been cancelled in the last month? No, I haven't, but I could definitely take that on notice. Do you think you'll be able to get it as uh, we are? Yes, we could, I can try and get that um, certainly yeah. during the discussion. Thank you. But the customer example you've given me does sound very <laughs> unusual, particularly with the fact that it's been cancelled. Uh, again, it's in a CBD area, it's FTTN. I, I would be more than happy to review that because it does seem very unusual. Mm. Um, last time we, I think you gave me, or well, you know, maybe it was a response to a question on notice, but you gave me a table of yeah. the numbers of appointments it takes for people to get the yes. NBN. 
No, I don't have that in front of me, but no. I think there were I do there were there were ten yeah. some people were getting needing ten appointments mm -hmm. to have the NBN mm. connected. I mean, the NBN chairman you know said that the seventy seven million dollars in corporate bonuses, and I use that word in the colloquial, I take your point, Mr. Thank you. but by saying that the NBN was a first rate network. Mm. Is that does that sound like a first-rate network to you? Uh, Senator Kitching, yes. I have the uh, numbers that, uh, from our discussion from last time, because you did ask me to give you an update oh, thank you. Uh, the yes, next thank time you we caught up. So, Yes, thank you. Senator, can I... Um, yes. I I'm, I'm sorry, I'm obviously slow this morning. <laughs> can, I, can I just add to some of the, the questions you asked me? Sure. Um, you, you asked me about the, uh, the, the thoughts of the committee regarding the short-term incentive. Mm -hmm. If I could just table pages 86 to 88 of the annual report, <coughs> excuse me, and that the is... The annual report's tabled anyway. Okay, thank you, Senator. Um, what, that, what that is, uh, is the, uh, again, it's a normal process, but this is a letter from the chair of the People and Remuneration Committee, which outlines the committee's thinking. Mm -hmm. So if I could just... If I could, uh, if, if table's the wrong word, Senator, if I could just re refer yeah. you to her, thank you. I'm not um, sure. The second, sorry, sorry, the, sorry, I just sorry, want to make, sorry, is sorry. it page 88? I'm sorry, page 86 through 88 is, is a letter from the chair. And it's a letter from, yes. Yeah, which which outlines the thinking of the remuneration committee. Uh, secondly, Senator, you asked me about our response back to the, um, uh, the government's review. The, the other very important point that we made was that uh, uh, NBN sources the vast majority of its talent from the corporate sector, plus we have some very, very important skills. So something like cyber security, which Senator you'd appreciate, is something I don't talk about publicly for good reason, but cyber security skills are needed as a national infrastructure of business, engineering skills, um, data scientists. So we need to have a remuneration structure that reflects the ability to attract and retain staff. And we do not pay, I can tell you, we do not pay at the top of the market. We play very much in the medium of the market. So our remuneration structures need to be reflective so of- So how many, how many cyber security experts or engineers have you employed? Uh, we would have, John, you would know that. Yeah, we've, um, we, uh, we've currently got a team of around 40 that we're working on cyber so security. 40. 40. Four zero on cyber, um, and that's a combination of a security team that's dedicated uh, on on a number of levels, plus support we have in um, our IT world. Mm -hmm. um, from an engineering point of view, um, our core engineering base um, would be circa around 150, to, uh, 150, 160 uh, core engineer. But, but they're just the within your organisation, John. Within you... within Catherine's team, within Brad's team, we also have skilled engineers. Without just some examples, Senator, whether it be network operating people, whether it be HR people, finance people, they all come from the, the, the um, vast majority come from the corporate sector. So we made that point. Yeah. The yeah. other thing, um, Senator Pratt, if I could correct something I said to you, I'm sorry, it was my error. I said to you the annual report was out before the corporate plan. That's not true. No, the annual report was tabled in, I believe, October, Senator, I, but, and the corporate plan was tabled in September. So I just wanted to correct that. Um, apologies you. for. Um, Have you had any um, cyber security incidents, uh, Senator? If you don't mind, that's not something no, we talk about. Right. If you don't um, mind, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go through some questions. Um, and I t so thank you for pointing out Dr. Swit Switkowski's letter. Uh, uh, sorry for being slow. I should have mentioned. No, it no, earlier. no. That's. Um, why is copper still being used if it's a first-rate network? Well, Senator, if I could just go to the... Um, um, Catherine can answer that, that specific question, but um, NBN supported... The, you, asked, you asked about the quality of the network. NBN supported the nation during a period when people were working from home, educating children from home, um, where, yes, but where, I'm asking can, why well, copper is still no, being No, no, Sandra, used. I'm going back to, you, you asked about the quality of the network. And, and it's not just MBN, it's also our retail partners, but the, the telecommunication industry, if it wasn't for the fact that people had access to high-speed broadband, lockdowns could not have continued in the period of time it did, because people simply couldn't communicate or work or study 
or, or do telehealth. So the network absolutely lived up to the needs I'm of the community. I'm asking why journal. copper is still it, being used I, in 2021. I'm, I'm, I'm answering, not asking I'm answering, for, I'm answering a previous question. We are all question. aware that people had to remotely I'm, ask, I'm just answering a previous question, school. Senator, about now in terms of copper. Uh, in terms of our copper use, we, uh, where we do need to install a new lead-ins for FTTC or remediate those lead-ins in, on a case-by-case -case basis, we do use copper in those instances. And we also, uh, if we have any remediation jobs on our fibre to the node, we <coughs> will selectively run copper as well. So there is still a, a place why not, for... Why not fi why aren't you using fibre? So if I look at the immediate as-built network, so for example, if you're in an FTTN area and you're a customer and you're having a service impacting event, the fastest way for us to reconnect you is via your native technology to go back and redesign, reinstall a new network you know, you couldn't get the customer activated in a short period of time. So it is very much but, but part of our... Didn't you have to do an overbuild, an overbuild of the copper network? Sorry, Senator, can you ask that again? Well, didn't, I thought that you had to do an over... I thought we discussed this actually, maybe not last time, maybe late last year. You had to do an overbuild of the copper network with fibre. No, no, Senator. What, what, we, what we announced last corporate plan was that we would, over a period to December 2023, amongst other things, uh, uh, in HFC and in fibres of curve, but in the fibres of node area, that we would build fibre in the street for two million, uh, that passes two million homes, which is a little under half of the fibre to the node network. And then when a customer ordered a, a higher speed tier than they can get under the fibre to the node, that at that point we would build the fibre and they, they could access a higher speed. So we're not, oh, we're not over building um, fibre to the node per se, in a sense it's not a forced overbuild. If people want higher speeds, and copper can provide it, we will provide that through fibre leading for those two million areas. But the fibre to the node network will continue, continue to perform for those who don't want to take up that additional service. So Senator Kitchen, you've had oh, can a I, half hour run. Can I just ask one You can ask question. one more and then I'm going to give the um, uh, call to Senator Ryan. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, in a recent response, a recent question on notice that sort of break, sought a breakdown of NBN bonuses by salary band. Um, the question on notice indicates that NBN paid out bonuses to 179 employees on a base salary between zero and $100,000. What I'd like to understand is how many people does NBN employ in total who receive a base salary between zero and 100000 Yeah. Um, I obviously don't have that to hand, Senator, but it's... You think it's, you can get it? It's, I can get that, but Senator, what I, what I, what, <clears throat> if I could just say on that, um, the, the particular roles that are often in that salary band don't necessarily have a... Uh, the market conditions doesn't necessarily put at risk salary for some people in those, in those bands, mm -hmm. which actually means that their salary is guaranteed as opposed to at risk. So the, it's the, the way that but the... But they're earning a lot less. No, that, but the, they, what Is they the are... Is the proportion... Uh, order, Senator that, Pratt, they are earning, the they're the earning a salary consummate to the market rate of the role that they're performing, but it is guaranteed in many cases, rather yes, than have a component at risk. The part of the salary, even the, the salaries that do have a component at risk, once you go up to the, to the cap, I'm sure that's higher than those who don't have salaries at risk anyway. The, the non-at-risk component of salaries the, that receive the, bonuses would nevertheless be higher than most of those other salaries. The, the, in almost all cases, I'm Senator, sure. Senator, what, what I can tell you is, is that we very much, and I actually personally, I personally go through this every year, we, we, we compare the salaries of each individual, and I go through the spreadsheet, by the way, and compare salaries to market conditions. And I can tell you that people at all bands are paid around about the median of market. In, at, the, at, a, at, Senator Pratt, at, at a particular... Please do not overtalk the witness. At a particular salary band, it may well be that the market conditions is the salaries are fixed. In other words, there is no at-risk component. That's not really what I'm asking. What I'm asking, and if you can get it while we're talking, yep. um, is how many 
people does the NBN employ yep. in total who receive a base salary between yep. zero dollars and one hundred thousand dollars? Sorry, Senator Kitching, I think this is in the questions on notice that you asked for. Yeah, it, I it have is. the answers to those questions on notice here. I'm happy but to table how many, that. Can I table how many, that, Chair? How many people? That's the questions on notice that Kimberly Kitching has already asked for that have already been answered. Yeah. So how many people does it does? The MBN employee in total Sorry, who receive a base yes, salary I've said yes. to one. Could the, actually, could the minister at the table stop talking over people? As well, to Sen a Senator Kitching. So how many people? Senator does Kitching. It, how many Senator people? Senator Kitching, just wait, please. The minister had asked previously if she could table that. I have answered her. Now, please continue your question. So, Mr. Rue, how many people does the MBN employee in total who receive a base salary between zero dollars and a hundred thousand dollars? If, if it's not in the um, answer that the minister has tabled, I'll, I will, my team are listening and we'll see if we can get an answer for you, Senator. So do you think you'll have that immediately? Uh, it's no. in the, you asked for it already. <coughs> it's been provided. So right. I'd like to hear Mr. Okay. Reed. Senator Kitching, that's your other question. Senator Thank McMahon, you. across to you, thanks. Um, Thank you. Um, mm. I'd just like to ask some questions. Um, um, Regarding your recent quarter three financials, please, Mr. Rue. Certainly. If I could get, unfortunately, Mr. Knox isn't here. So if you can, you just bear with me while yes. I get them while I get them up. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, and Chair, just what we do that band is not in that response to that question on notice. So I'd like Mr. Rue to find that information, please. No. If the question band is 12. not in that question, that the band is not in that response to the question on notice. Okay. You think it's. You think 179 is the figure. I'm after the I band, and Mr. Rue is. If Mr. Rue can find that quickly, that would be good. Well, I'm sure the officials will be happy to take it. Thank you. On notice to come back to you with the information. Do you have the press release? Can you? Sorry, Senator. I may give you the general answer till I get the final report. Apologies. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, are you able to provide the committee with an, an overview of uh, your recent quarter three financial earning results? Yeah, yes, Senator. We were we were pleased with the performance of the company at all at all levels from a revenue point of view. Um, we're on track. Certainly, what I think from the quarter three results, we were able to show that we're on track for the um, uh, the, re the the revenue, the full year revenue targets. We're on track, which was which was 4.5 billion. We're on track to um, be in and around 8.2 million connected premises, which is what we said on the, um, uh, in last year's corporate plan. I'm really pleased that the number of premises not able to connect to NBN, which started the year at just over 100,000, is now down to 20,000, I believe, yep, Catherine? Just under 20,000. Um, so we now have 11 point, at, at the end of March, we had 11.9 million premises ready to connect. We had 8.1 million premises actually connected and, as I said, on track to hit the 8.2 for the year. And we had 3.5 billion revenue, which was up 23%. Um, and again, our, our what's called our earnings before interest tax depreciation amortisation was 0.9 billion. Now, the important thing there, Senator, is that's a 1.6 billion turnaround year on year. And that's a really important line because that demonstrates the ongoing cash flow of the business, which will pay for capital expenditure going forward. Um, we also were able to, uh, uh, it, we also um, said that our revenue from business customers was up 24%. And importantly, uh, we've continued with the upgrade program, as we call it, or the, or the additional investment, which we promised in last year's corporate plan. So we've now announced 1.1 million premises of the, out of the 2 million fibre to the node areas. Um, uh, Mr. Parkin at the end there has been instrumental in bringing the HFC network to the point that as of today around about 60% or 6 in 10 of people on the 2.5 million footprint can get up to 1 gig speeds and I think John almost everybody can get 250 megabits per second. That's right, that everyone network. can and, and by, the end of, um, by the end of June 80% of that network will be at a, uh, enabled at 1 gig and by the end of this calendar year 95% of that network. So, Senator, I think the the, um, the progress. I've been pleased with the progress of the company because any company that goes from a, a period when it was largely building a network to, to now largely serving customers, 
um, notwithstanding a couple of issues that Catherine was talking about earlier. Um, I, I, the vast majority of customers on MBN are getting a great service, and we as a organization are performing well financially too. That's why we've been able to borrow the money that I talked about in my opening statement. Um, so you, you confirmed that you, you are on track, in fact, for that $4.5 billion? We are, Senator, yes. Yep. And you, you fully expect that will be the result? Well, there's a month to go, so <laughs> you always cross fingers, but yes, we're on track, Senator. Um, it's, it's a pretty strong, as you've, you've indicated, it's a pretty strong um, result for you. Um, what are the main things that you, you credit as, as giving you that, um, that quite amazing uh, figure, really? Yeah, I think, Senator, that, that when, when, you know, when, when we sat down to do our long-term plan back in, way back, back in 2014 and 15, when I first joined the company, um, with, in fact, Mr Whitcomb, we always looked at this period as a period of transition and a period whereby um, we would need to work on um, uh, getting greater and greater operating efficiency and driving our revenue streams. So there's no doubt that the fact that we have built on built the network by June 2020 that we said we would, we have we've seen the take up rate that we've said we would for six years, and that's enabled us to have lots of customers on the network. The fact that we we were able to support Australia through the COVID lockdown period as well has has led to more customers. Um, getting greater satisfaction, but it also has helped towards um, some customers moving on to higher speed tiers. So, and on top of that, we have been, um, uh, we have been, as we always anticipated, becoming more and more efficient as, a, as an operating business unit. So, um, uh, you know, in some ways, the turnaround was, was, is expected at this time, but, but actually executing upon it, we're, we've been pleased with the way we've done that. Fantastic. Um... Can you give us an update on improvements in your free cash flows? Yeah, so again, the free cash flow, I think the best way to think of free cash flow is that earnings before interest tax depreciation line, um, because free cash flow is effectively capital, sorry, it's cash flows that's available to be able to um, uh, pay off interest and also to um, invest in capital expenditure. So that turnaround that I talked around in earnings before interest tax of 1.6 billion between fiscal, the, the nine months to March 2020 compared to nine months of March 2021 is quite an extraordinary turnaround. Um, it does reflect in part the decline of the um, historical legacy subscriber payments to Telstra and Optus, but it also reflects the, um, the growth of the customers on our network and the management of, of our costs. So, yeah, um, so the answer is the turnaround of 1.6 billion is really all is all reflected in free cash flow, which augurs very well for the future of the company. Which is actually why we're able to continue to raise capital on the debt markets. Yeah, it is. It is as as you said, um, quite an amazing result. Um, do you expect this growth to continue? Well, Senator, I'm always um, reluctant, as you know, in this committee to speculate around the future. But obviously, if we continue to build customers on our network. We continue to deliver great services to them. Um, there will be ro further roll off of legacy payments, and there will be, um, as we go from having a um, an operating unit that largely supported build and a large build. We're still building. We'll always build. That's part of any network, but a large scale nationwide build and serving customers to one that's primarily serving customers. You would expect us to continue with operating efficiency. So. Um, you know, all things being equal, you absolutely would expect this to continue. Great. Um, can you provide an update on your debt raising history, specifically? Um, yeah. Why are you debt raising? Yeah. So, so back in oh my goodness, I'm going to say 2018, but that could be the wrong date. But around that time, um, we entered into a loan agreement with the Commonwealth Government, whereby. Um, on top of the, of the Commonwealth Government providing us $29.5 billion equity, um, they agreed to provide us a $19.5 billion loan um, at a fixed interest rate of 3.96 that had a repayment date that was since extended in a further agreement to June 2024. So basically the Commonwealth's exposure or the shareholders' exposure to NBN is equity of $29.5 billion 
and $19.5 billion worth of debt, which it expects the company to refinance. So um, we're in the process of raising capital on the debt markets and through banks to do two things, to refinance that $19.5 billion loan and to enable us to continue to invest in the programs that we've been talking about, the, um, the fibre to the node, the fibre extension in the street, the HFC work, the fibre to the curb work, um, uh, and ongoing investment in, in co-investing with state governments and into particularly small and medium business enterprises. So, um, so the, the, the second answer, the answer to your second question is the reason why we're raising capital is primarily to refinance that loan, but also to continue to have capital to keep investing. The history of this is that we, we, um, we, we have been in the market since the early stage of last year, I believe, um, whereby we started to raise bank debt. Um, we raised a total of $6 billion worth of bank debt. We then went to the Australian bond market and raised more capital. We then raised more bank debt. And then we've, we've just more, most recently gone into what's called the US 144A market, which is a bond market, a corporate bond market in the US, and raised 2.2 2 billion US, which is approximately 2.6 billion Australian dollars. So we're in a program between now and June 2024 of um, continuing to raise debt. Our corporate plan last year talked around a debt of up to 27.5 billion, which will be used to repay the government and to, and to um, fund those investments I talked about. Thank you. Um, could I now move on to ask some questions about uh, network reliability and speeds? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, could you update us on your most recent reliability metrics, including what is the most recent network uptime? John. Yeah. Across the board, we're um, in terms of the overall uh, network performance, Senator, I will, I'll get that question on notice so that I'm just absolutely with the team, just factually correct. But we've cer certainly been working to improve the overall network. And um, uh, as Mr. Roos said, we're, as we're building out the capacity of the network, we're currently seeing across the board <laughs> of 35% of the overall network where customers can now reach in and receive a one gigabit speed. And we're continuing to build that um, that capability across all of our technology types at the moment. But I'll get you the actual uh, number in a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, thank, thank you. Um, and also, uh, what are the most recent network congestion figures? Do you, do yeah. you have those? Yeah. Our congestion figures have been um, have, have been very very low. We've um, through the whole COVID era, we spent um, a significant amount of time in improving the capacity of the network, and um, and so our core metrics are sitting, you know, very very close to zero congestion across the core network, and uh, and it's something we're extremely proud of, um, and it's um, it's a metric that we um, that we um, uh, govern very very closely, um, and when I look at one particular one, which is our, the node health. Um, for our HFC network, it's never been higher in the company, and that's um, particularly a measure of around about 95%, which um, demonstrates the health of that network. From a congestion and utilisation point of view, uh, we've got no significant call-outs. It's, uh, it's performing incredibly well. Excellent. Um, and how, how does it perform during um, these lockdowns that we are sort of frequently experiencing? Yeah. Um, yeah, we certainly saw um, an exponential growth of traffic on the network uh, through the COVID era. Um, uh, we, uh, we managed the network um, at all of its core elements. Um, we, we look very much for utilisation, uh, we look for congestion, and we've been able to stay in front of demand, and, um, and we've taken uh, significant steps to proactively increase the overall head, headroom of the network. Um, it's currently carrying um, in the order of around just over 16 terabits of traffic um, every single day. Um, and we've created the headroom uh, for that network to not only manage that traffic, but also create the burst speeds that customers will need in the busy hours as well. So uh, for, at a core network level, it's performing extremely well. Um, so it, it has no problem coping with the increased traffic? No, we've had, we've had no um, significant congestion issues across the network. 
fantastic. Um, with regard to speeds, uh, what proportion of customers would you have on plans greater than 50 megabits? I might have to switch here. Um, okay. And Brad will have all that, I'm sure. Yeah. You can be Catherine Dyer yeah. for that. Are you? Yeah, so um, we have seen a significant shift up in terms of the, the what we call the speed tier mix. And specifically to your question right now, we're at 72% of all customers on the NBN are at speeds of 50 or above. <coughs> I think if you take that a bit further, we've also seen much more interest in the very high speeds. So we're currently at 17% that are on 100 and above. Okay. Um, and, and maybe even more interestingly, um, we're at about 8% are on the 250 and above, which is um, a significant shift from what we would have seen even six months ago. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you attribute that to um, COVID and the lockdowns? I think it's a combination of end customer demand and then also we have worked very closely with our um, retail service providers to make it attractive to um, give customers an opportunity to experience those very high speed um, plans. So we call that our focus on fast. Through that focus on fast program, we've had, um, I think we're sitting at around 900,000 customers that have had their services upgraded. It's not just at the, at the very high end though. We also are um, incentivizing customers to move from the 12 and the 25 up to the 50, where we believe that for many customers, they'll get a better experience. And- um, yeah, Last question, thanks. <clears throat> okay, sorry. What, uh, could you explain to me the um, Focus on Fast campaign? Yeah, so this is a, um, a six-month campaign that we're running with the, the retail service providers. Um, we believe there are a number of customers that could be better served on higher speeds. Uh, so we want to stimulate that market, give customers an opportunity to try it out uh, with the expectation that a number of those customers will remain on those plans. So. We've really flattened the curve in terms of what we, our wholesale prices that we charge to retailers for the higher speed tiers. So our, um, our home fast, our home super fast, and our home ultra fast. Um, and this has uh, had really strong take up from retailers. So they then are contacting their customers to um, let them know that they now have access to much higher speeds than they would have had um, in the past. Um, and then um, after six months time, the retailers and the customers will decide whether they in indeed want to stay on those or potentially they want to go back to where they were. So it's a, it's a bit, I wouldn't call it an experiment, but it's a way to stimulate the market. And uh, so far we've had much better response than we had anticipated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just before I uh, hand the call back, Senator Kitching, I just want to clarify so we can record which mm -hmm. questions on notice have to be carried forward. Yeah. My recollection is you are asking for information about the number of employees in a salary band. Uh, answer number 12 here, does that address your question? No, it doesn't because firstly, that's 179 employees who received a bonus. It doesn't tell me the no, total the number. Question 12 has 216 employees in the salary band. Zero no, that's a few previous financial year. Okay, that's fine. So you can so just I'd clarify like exactly what you're asking. Year. Can you, are you able to do that? I've asked the team, Senator. I know exactly what you're asking. Yeah, thank you. And see, so the CEO knows, the minister doesn't, and was really, that was quite smart. Sorry, that's my mistake, Chair. It's yes. just that so many questions have been asked about this. Okay, thank you. We've now got that no, clarified. No, thank you. Oh. Senator Kitching, you have so the many, call. So, sorry, is there some uh, misunderstanding that estimates is about transparency and accountability? Is there some misunderstanding? No. Senator from Kitching. About that, Senator really? Senator Kitching, I don't believe so. You have the call. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rue, can you also, if you're able, I'm sorry, I want the total number in that band, as, yeah, you, un as yeah. you understand. Yeah. But I would also like um, if you can break it down between zero and 50,000 and 50,000 and $1 to $100,000. Um, we'll look at that, so, so of course we will, Sam, but we will not have that. No, no, next... I'm, and I'm, what yeah. I really want now is the total 
number <coughs> in that band. So, but when you can break it down and just give take it on notice. Yeah, I will. I, I, absolutely. Um, can I just on a, just just for total clarity, <laughs> you're looking for the total number of employees in that band. Yes. And are you looking for uh, the component that was in the scheme or just the total? I want the both? total number of employees. The total number of employees, in zero, the, to, in, zero, zero to zero to one hundred thousand. Yep, and then broken halfway. Yes, one yep, yes, but it. if you can get that, if your team who are listening can get that total number now as soon as they oh, they're, can, they're looking because same. I can't imagine that's going to be very difficult. Uh, I actually don't to know, ascertain. I, I don't know, but the team are looking at that. But certainly the uh, the second piece, I think, will be harder. But yeah, yeah, we'll the look. second, the split between, I yeah. would like, but that's not as urgent as the. Yeah, understand. Um, yes, just one moment, chair. Sheldon, and then come back to me. Senator Sheldon, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, and um, good morning to you all. Good morning, Senator. On the 9th of May 2021, the CPU wrote to you raising a number of serious matters, uh, Mr. Rue, affecting the workforce and seeking a meeting uh, with you. Um, the specific matters raised in that letter was the S Max dispatch platform, yep. uh, the pyramid contracting scheme undermining working conditions in the industry minimum rates, and finally examples of malfeasance, feasance, corruption and misuse of public funds. Mr Rue, I understand that you received a response from the CPU again last night, some 18, whilst they've been waiting for a meeting with you for 18 days, um, and a further request was made um, last night. Um, are, are you going to meet with the CPU? Um, yes, Senator, so a few, so a few things on that. Um, um, <clears throat> My, my, there's been multiple members of my team, including people in, I thought you were Catherine. <laughs> Maybe we should get Catherine back up here again. Um, multiple people in Catherine's team who's been um, uh, involved at various levels, Senator, to um, address at a grand level some of the, que some of the questions that have been asked. Um, I actually wrote back uh, this morning, um, following the letter. Oh, just before um, estimates, that's very timely, Mr. Rose. I, I got a I got a letter last night, mm -hmm. Senator. So I actually was. Well, actually, this you you received a letter, Mr. Rue, um, on the 9th of May. That's I correct, did. isn't it? We did, Senator, and and following that, we we had multiple meetings with um, the various levels of the of the union, and we responded. Um, the my um, uh, head of people and culture responded on behalf of the company to the letter. But since then, I've, I've, I'm very happy to meet the... Um, I'm very happy to meet Shane Sandra. Who are the levels of the union that you've met with since the 9th of May? Can you provide that yes. to us? Uh, so we did meet um, with the, uh, the head of the CPU and... What was, date said, was that, Miss Dwight? I, I will have to check. I'll check the exact date. Uh, it was before the letter to Mr Rue. Uh, and it was in relation to uh, uh, some correspondence we'd received from the CPU uh, that our delivery partners had also received and from uh, direct contact with them. So a meeting was set up with uh, two of my executive general managers in construction and field services. Right, so and Mr Roo didn't meet with no, them? No. Right, no. OK. No, that's... For clarity. Thanks, Mr Roo. That's, uh, that's thank fine. you, yeah. uh, Ms Dyer. Um, when the, the serious questions were raised, um, the CPU raised examples of serious and willful malfeasance, as I said before, and regarding the use of taxpayers' funds. Um, it's taken 18 days for what is, to me, as serious allegations when those allegations are made. Um, the, I can understand having other um, junior executives involved, but I would see that logically, Mr. Rue, those allegations are very serious. There's something that you'd want to get first hand and then have your crew look at. Yep. And I know this is this is a you know, or is it trying to be whitewashed? No, not at all, Senator. Not at all. I absolutely assure you that. That's that's not who we are. Um, we have a and I, I was here at the previous hearing, Senator, and I encouraged um, publicly encouraged people who, who had um, issues they wanted to raise, to raise them, and raise them even directly with us through what we call our whistleblower program. So not at all, Senator. So, so we, you, we, you want we, it raised that way rather than raised not, with not at all. Uh, with the union, who can actually, many of these people are contractors in, within operations as well. Um, you know, they uh, can raise serious concerns about uh, victimisation. Um, you know, I've, I've, in my previous life, was um, actually the 
elected leader of the biggest small business organisation in this country um, for owner drivers. So I know what the sort of pressure that can be applied to owner drivers um, to cut corners and not receive fair payment. Now, so did you and have you, um, and you haven't for 18 days, met with the CPU on these serious uh, matters? Uh, Senator, I'm, uh, as I said to you, I um, actually wrote to, uh, actually following the letter that I received last night, I wrote back this morning actually asking, and I've asked one of my teams to set up a meeting very soon. But, but Senator, rather, what, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, the, the people on the ground, the people who know the details, to, sorry if I could just finish, to get into what was the sort of things that was being raised? Mr. Mr. Rue, I, I, respect, I respect the fact that, you, that you've got a view about it. What I'm saying is that view, um, in um, my opinion, is an accurate way to actually deal with such a serious allegations that have been made. Well, well, so, Senator, and one Senator Sheldon, you have asked Mr. Rue what he has done. You've just indicated you don't agree with his approach, but at least let him answer your question what he has done. You can then ask so, him further so Senator, questions. Can I, can I, can I'm more than happy to have the details of meetings who attended on notice um, when the meetings attended, um, we when, can these matters that, were, where, when these matters were discussed. I, I had, I have. I want to ask you another sorry, question. I want to ask you another Senator question. Sheldon, Mr. Rue was halfway through just responding. Please let him finish. Can I give you an example? Well, well we've got, um, what's it, 15 so, minutes less than 15 minutes to actually deal with this matter and there's some serious allegations on behalf of owner operators that have been mis, mis uh, Senator Sheldon, dealt with by these Senator people Sheldon, in the end. I am happy for you to answer to prosecute your questions, but we do have rules of debate in here which are so that it's not the loudest voice who wins. It's about people having the opportunity to put onto the public record questions and answers about information. That's how democracy works. Mr. Roo, please finish your question. Senator Sheldon, I'll give you some extra time. But let's follow the rules that make this a civilised democracy. Yeah, uh, I was only, uh, Senator, if you, if you want to move on to another question, that's fine. I, all I wanted to... Chair, it, just, just on, I do want to move on to another question, thank you. Yeah, okay. He just invited me and I said I want to move on to another question. I just want to make a point. If there is a long-winded answer, and I appreciate that um, long-winded for me, Mr. Roo thinks it's probably <coughs> concise, um, and I need to get to the questions. He's already answered the question that I've asked. Then I will need to go to the next matter. And raise a point of order with me, and I'll ask the witness to cut his answer short. Thank you, Chair. Um, does MBN employ a process during its tendering process to ensure its delivery partners are able to pay its workforce fairly and legally? Uh, yes, we do, Senator. Uh, so throughout our contracting, uh, I guess, RFP process, we, uh, we do can go you, through can a very... I just, can I just ask you that you can take <laughs> it on notice? Come on. Uh, please allow the witnesses to answer the question. I'm saying I, I ask them to take it on notice. It is, we've got... I appreciate the Chair has said that we will go a little bit over time, but there are quite a few matters, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just want to ascertain, have you got a system? Yes, yes, of course we do. Thank you. What... Um, so ongoing, do you agree with the basic premise that NBN funds are public funds, taxpayers' money? Mr. Rue? Um, NBN is, a, um, uh, is, is owned by the Commonwealth Centre, so although we may have funds um, directly from the government or borrowing from government or external, we are, we are, absolutely, fund we are absolutely owned by the Australian Government Centre. Minister, is it, do you see it as being taxpayers' money, NBN funds? I think that we covered this a little earlier today. Yeah, uh, Chair, I am confused here because I'm, uh, is Labor suggesting that workers at NBN should not be paid in accordance with their employment contracts? I mean, uh, Senator, uh, I'm actually, Mr. I'm actually asking you the question. Yes. Can you answer it? I, I, that's why I'm asking. Answering. I'm asking I am you confused. the questions. That's the funny thing about estimates. Our job is to ask you questions, I'm for a and our hope is that you turn around and, and give an I'm answer. I'm asking for a cl clarification. Are you Do you agree with the basic are premise? You sorry. To be fair. Order. No, I'm after a clarification. Order. Are Senator you Green. suggesting? Are you trying to throw it back in? Minister? Senator May I Sheldon. for a clarification, Chair? I understand that. Minister, you've made the point that you put this on the record earlier. Senator Sheldon, if there are things that are different in your question to what was answered earlier, please articulate that. If not, let's move on. So I take it quite clearly that you don't see it as taxpayers' money. I have just asked Do you for agree a that when MBN that provides that wasn't a question, it was a statement. <laughs> Do you agree that when MBN provides funds to delivery partners to conduct work in its name it's and in its uniforms, 
that the use of that money should be scrutinised as the use of public money. I'm sorry, is this a question for me? Mr. Rue, and then I'll, I'll, and, and uh, Minister, you'll have an opportunity as well. I, I think, I think, Senator, that um, given that the given that NBN is is 100 percent owned by the by the Commonwealth, um, the committee is perfectly entitled to ask whatever questions it wishes. Thank you, Mr. Rue. I would like to start with the topic of payment rates, which appears to be the most fundamental factor in what's going on with some of the problems with regards to payments in the SMAX system. In a recent current affairs segment, MBN technicians claimed they were not earning enough to meet the basic requirements of making superannuation contributions. How does this correlate with the processes in place to ensure fair employment and contracting arrangements exist when working on these publicly funded infrastructure projects? And one of those examples um, where a person was saying literally he was not able to put food on the table. Sometimes on some days he was earning as little as uh, two, uh, $2. Um, Subcontracted MBN technician Glenn said he makes 100 to 150 bucks in, in, uh, out of most of the days that he, that he works on. So how, how can the system be operating effectively if people are getting so badly ripped off? Mm. Uh, Senator, so in relation to what you're talking about there, at the last uh, estimates hearing, um, we were asked about the implementation of our new contract Unify and our new IT system. And uh, I did encourage anyone that was having issues to write to me, uh, subcontractors. And uh, I have had... Order. Senator Pratt. <coughs> Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt, I'm the chair of this committee. When I call you to order, you will remain silent. Please and allow I, the witness to continue. Ms. I, I apologise for go, take, telling a bit of a story, but I think it's useful to the con context of your question. If, if you could keep it short. Okay. Well, so um, I had a number of subcontractors write to me. I personally telephoned those subcontractors to talk through their issues as they wrote to me about... They addressed the issues that you... Uh, speaking about. So what we have done uh, with the implementation of Unify, we have mapped back their previous rates, we're in the process of doing this, to the revised rates in the contracts they're getting. So we're, we're taking a very diligent approach in how we are looking at what is happening in the field. The second thing we've done, recognising that some techs have had what we call a settling time with the new uh, operating environment. We have introduced a what we're calling an interim systems enablement payment. So contractors now working on the MBN as they're going through the conversion to the new system can claim that rate for the jobs that they're doing on the MBN. So to your point, we are recognising uh, some techs have had a productivity issue as they've cut over we are recognising that some of them have had their payments impacted. We've introduced this rate whilst we do the investigation across the two rate platforms and we make uh, we continue to improve that environment for our workforce. Ms Dibe, seriously, you're saying to me that you're negotiating um, individually. How many technicians um, have paid under the system and how many contractors that engaged technicians have paid under this system? So we pay the delivery partner, yes, who is our... Yes, just a total figure of people that are within the network? The broad, broadly speaking, it, broadly speaking, it, an average of field people uh, working on the network is about 1,800 a day. Right. So it's 1,800 a day. You've said you've had a few, few conversations. Now, there's quite clearly um, raised in that current affair program serious concern about how the, how the payment system is working. Um, has there been, uh, has there, is there intent to reach an agreement with the um, CPU on what the arrangements and rates should be so that people can be paid a decent wage, not one that you just arbitrarily see as okay? Because Ms Dyer, we've got it wrong before. We've got it wrong before this last occasion. This is the, certainly the assertion from many technicians. Um, I've got no confidence it's going to be right now unless there's actually capacity for a negotiation to take place about what is an appropriate rate to be paid for those technicians mm. and those contractors. I'm going to give you a quick uh, example. What we have found in one of the examples of the subcontractors that I spoke to was, and I see this as an, uh, an implementation problem or an education issue, that contractor completing an FTTN assurance ticket 
uh, in the new system, they can claim for one rate, and then as they do other activities, they can build on that rate. There has been, there has been a disconnect in the implementation with some of our subcontractors. We are working to close that. So I'm not suggesting the rates are wrong, but I'm trying to, we are trying to work out how we can uh, make sure our subcontractors are being paid fairly. They can understand the rates in the contract. But in the meantime, just whilst we you know, get them cut over and they're operating really effectively, we are giving them uh, an interim payment to make sure that they're not adversely impacted. So, yeah. Ms. Di, can I just say, if, if people are getting paid as little as 60 to $70 for half a day. They're getting paid 100 and this is $100 thereabouts. Some people are saying they're getting $2 a day. Um, no offence, but I don't have confidence that MBN can work out how to appropriately or properly remunerate the contracting base. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite clearly, those are savage amounts of uh, low amounts. It's been going on for some considerable time, and there isn't a confidence unless you can reach a formal agreement with the CEPU about it. I mean, how can people actually put food on the table if they're getting paid those sorts of incomes? Senator, that is absolutely not the intention. We absolutely, working with our partners, it is about paying people fairly. But we do recognise as we implemented the new system, there was a short period of time. We actually, there was a, a global outage on uh, one of the systems we were using. There were two days that work didn't flow through. We know that that impacted the subcontracting environment. But what we can absolutely see now is there, an, there is an abundance of work. We can see the contractors, I can see their productivity and the work that they're completing. And I do believe that they are back to where they previously were. Well, Ms. Dyer, that's, that's certainly not the evidence that's been given by the technicians, uh, which makes me uh, more, more concerned about the evidence you've just given and the assertion you've just made. I want to ask this question about, I want to take you through an example of losses incurred by the recent changes from additional tasks versus hourly rate. A technician by the name of Jeff was previously paid $61 for a default activation task and then $96 to install an extension. The total payment rate for the job was $147. Under the new payment structure, he receives $61 for the activation and is paid 30 minutes to run an extension, which is $33. The total payment rate is $97. Now, the payment rate for the same job has been reduced from $147 to $97, a cut of $50 or a 34% cut of the original payment rate. So who's responsible for that? So, Senator, um, as I said earlier before, we are now, because we've recognised that our contractors in terms of the how a, a, a task has gone from one contract to another, from one IT system to another, we are doing that line of sight now to compare, to look at what the techs are seeing. We don't believe there's inherently a problem, but we are looking at those types of issues of what the contractor is experiencing and you know, a, fair, a fair work value as well. So Mr. Roo, is there a problem when we've got people saying that they are getting paid working and getting paid as little as two dollars a day? So, so Have that, we got a problem when there's a 34 per cent reduction in the original payment rate? So that is Have we got a problem when people say that they aren't able to turn around and um, you know, put food on their table? That, that is exactly what, what <clears throat> that's actually one of the examples I was going to give you earlier, but, but I'll let you ask another question. Uh, that's why so I can't. No, yeah, I'm asking you a question about is that 34 per cent reduction in rate that, appropriate? That, that's why Catherine has wrong specific individual technicians who've written into her to see is it a rate issue or is it a productivity issue or is it a system issue? And or that's. Is it the Order, Senator Pratt. Of this world. And that is why we are also doing the exercise, as Catherine said, to compare the old rates, exactly the exercise, that, um, Senator, you've just you've just listed there, compare the old rates for a, for a particular job compared to the new rates to ensure that there isn't a, 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 an can issue. I, can I just ask you um, why it's been done now, not in consultation with the union that can represent the technicians, and before the implementation? This seems outrageous to someone have a 34 per cent, a contractor trying to, to support their family, trying to keep their business operating, having a 34 per cent arbitrary reduction in their rate yeah. by NBN is outrageous, isn't it? 
Senator, what we are doing is, as part of this review, we are going to uh, meet with subcontractors. We are doing this independently, so it's independent to MBN. We have brought in an independent uh, group to do this for us. They will be doing field visits. They will be doing work time value studies as well. Because So we're going to do this very thoroughly. This is going to take a matter of weeks. An additional thing that we did do after the last Senate estimates is I personally wrote to the CEOs of our delivery partners. And I stepped out a series of questions to them about their contracting relationships with their subcontractors, their payment, that the way they pay their subcontractors, uh, and we met with the CEOs of those companies. We are taking the claims very, very seriously, and um, I think that we've got a, a good work program <coughs> to factually look at this, and um, it's progressing well. Mr. I appreciate you gave the evidence. Sheldon, uh, we are due to go to a break now. If you only have one more question, we'll answer that. If you've got a list of questions, I'll come back to you after the yeah, break. I'll come back. Can, can I okay. just ask before we go to the break? Ms. Moore, you didn't answer the question that Senator <coughs> Sheldon raised, and that is why, why are you doing that now rather than prior to implementation? Why, why is that happening? Why are people losing money when you haven't done that test, you haven't done all that before it was implemented? When we modelled the new uh, contracting environment, we, we did not see, we, we, don't, we did not see what is, you know, the feedback that we're getting now. We did not notice that. So there was, there was very little change in the rates overall if, from what we could see. So what I'm, I guess I'm acknowledging is some subcontractors, some, are, 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 you know, are calling out that there's issues. So we are looking at to see if the way that we have uh, built up the schedule of rates and the way the subcontractor is experiencing those uh, schedule of rates, if there's something adversely playing out. So to answer your question, it was a model. We worked through it very thoroughly. Uh, we spent a long time on it. But now we have had feedback. So just, just my final one is what happens now to the, that, that um, contractor that Senator Sheldon raised? Um, like his rate's been reduced. He's lost 30 per cent of his original payment. How does he how does he get reimbursed and, and compensated back for that? Well, I, I did call out that we have put in this uh, interim payment, which is $75 per job. So that's a good amount per um, to Senator Sheldon's um, call out before. That can be claimed by technicians. This has been communicated to the CEPU. It's been communicated to our delivery partners. So we're acknowledging and we absolutely don't want that experience to play out for our subcontractors. We're very much acknowledging that. We've done that until the end of July, whilst we work through some of these potentially anomalies. But we're not sure if that is, you know, if that is an anomaly or if it's the way the subcontractor is experiencing the app themselves. Okay, thank you. One simple question. Did, did you reach an agreement with the CPU what the rate should be before you change them? Uh, our negotiations are with the delivery partner, not with the CEPU. Okay, we Thank will you. I'll come suspend the now and the committee will resume at 10.50.
Being uh, 10 to 50, the committee will resume. Senator Sheldon, you have the call. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rue, was the implementation of the SMAX app used to restructure and change payment rates to MBN technicians and small business subcontractors? Um, yeah. The intention of the Service Max app was uh, to get, provide, um, if we think back to why uh, the app was brought in in the first place. Uh, Chair, I just, it's not, not because, it just, it's, this is about the answer of the question I'm actually asking. I'm asking, was the implementation of the SMAX app used to restructure and change payment rates to MBN technicians and small business contractors. I appreciate that you've okay. done it for a variety of reasons, but I'm particularly asking you about um, change to payment rates to MBN technicians and small business subcontractors. So in relation to the schedule of rates, I think from the previous uh, operating model to the new, I think there's three less rates. So from a, apples to apples, there's the same amount of rates, but some of them have been restructured. And what we are finding, which was back to one of my earlier points, we are finding subcon some subcontractors are confused with them and don't realise that they can claim multiple things for a, a piece of work that they're doing. So those rates go, do the rates um, go up or do they go down? Uh, it depends on what the uh, tech the is doing. In yeah. some instances, they have gone up. In others, they have gone down or changed, depending on the work activity. But, Senator, we are in a very different environment than what we were five years ago when we were building the network and we're connecting more customers. And I think to your earlier point before about, you know, conduiting and stuff like that. Yeah. Look, look, I appreciate you going into some detail. Well, I'm not really asking the question about. Right. Um, by all means, if you want to make you know, some question on notice, I'll give that to you, and, um, but thank you. Who did uh, MBN Company consult uh, with before changing payment rate arrangements and the reduction that's taken place? So we ran a, a consultative process with our industry partners. Uh, we obviously, uh, you know, we having spent now 10 years building and connecting customers and assuring customers, we had all of that information available to us, of, you know, uh, in, in relation to the industry. So we went through a, a, an RFP process and we consulted with the industry to form those rates. So you, you go to the companies that you're engaging to contract to and saying, uh, what's the new rate system that we're going to put in place? Um, because, you know, and you're the top of the supply chain and, you're, and they're geared up to actually provide those services. They haven't got too many other places to go. There are other places, there's not too many other places for some of these technicians to go and some of these services. And you're saying to them, oh, let's work out what the rate is together. It's not exactly an even bargaining field, is it? And, 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 and I'll get to this question. Was there any consultation directly with unions, small business, sub, uh, small business contractors or technicians about impacts to payment rates prior to the decision being made? The, the RFP process is a very structured, highly governed process and it, it's an auditable process and it's a very important process to make sure the commerciality of our contracts are secure. So that was a very robust process. That conversation was had with the bidders for the work with MBN. Now, the, the delivery partners would look at the work that was on offer, and it is and it is worth noting here, it is declining work as well. If you think, and I think a lot of the well, can I, I'm, not, I'm not asking about declining. I, can, I, I will intervene here. Um, that's not what Senator Sheldon asked. Okay. Uh, in the interest of keeping order, and if we can keep working collaboratively, no can I ask you to focus on well, by all means, give some context, but okay. come to the point of yeah. the question. So we, we run an RFP process, is the answer. So that means you didn't consult with unions, small business contractors uh, or technicians. Can I then ask you this question? Can you confirm that under BSA, the contracting firm, fibre to the node activation payments have dropped from $98 to $85? I, 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 I can't confirm that, and yeah. So that's that's a thirteen percent reduction. Can you confirm that under BSA fibre to the curb activation payments have dropped from ninety seven dollars to sixty one dollars forty, which is close to a thirty percent drop? Again, I can't confirm that, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Can you confirm the fibre to the basement activation payments have dropped from one hundred and five dollars to eighty four dollars forty three? Again, I would need to look at that. That's, that's nearly a, that's, in that case, that's nearly a 20% drop. So we've got these 
substantial drops in payments, no negotiations with the technicians or the small business operators, no negotiation with the union representing many of those workers, and you're an arbitrary decision to turn around and up to 30 or 33 per cent reduction in rates without consultation with those people that are directly affected. When there is a fundamental thing about misuse of market power here, and you're using the market power to hold somebody else accountable for what you're doing as an organisation. Is that correct? I, uh, that's not the way I would see it, Senator. The way I would see it is, you know, MBN is spending um, a lot of money, and I think, as has been discussed today, arguably taxpayers' money, and we've got to spend that efficiently and effectively. And that's, you know, our commitment in, from an operating division that I represent. Mr. I, I, I would have hoped, in light of the fact that there were, we were looking at um, the reductions in rates across the system, you said that's part of your remit. Um, that there would be, in light of those substantial reductions, um, that there would have been proper, um, a proper response to those particular questions because the 30 per cent reduction is a substantial amount and those significant work. Now, I want to ask you this question. Can you confirm the payment to install and remove a distribution point unit, depending on the delivery partner, has decreased from somewhere between $108 to $80? to an hourly rate payment of $60 per hour, where the expected payment is close to $30. I, I can't confirm that. I'll have to take that on notice. Can you confirm the installation of a lead-in cable underground has dropped from $90 to an hourly rate payment rate of $60 per hour, where the expected payment is, is $30? Senator Sheldon, I think what I tried to explain before was... Um, I'm, I'm just simply asking whether, whether you can confirm the installation of a cable with that rate. No, whether you're aware I can't. Of it not, not offhand, I can't. But we are mapping... Thank you. We, we can, can you name one industry where a technician turns up in a van, enters a customer's home, performs a job and gets paid $60? No, I can't. That's, that. Senator, I think all we're saying is that that's the exercise we're going through to do exactly that mapping and ensure that they are. That's what I'm. That's what I'm raising yeah, serious and, questions about. And and thank you for that. And and we, we also need to ensure that are we comparing like what like through all that as well, Senator. And that's that's why we're actually doing this exercise. And we're doing this exercise with um, an external body. So we're not doing it. It's not a you know people sitting at MBN doing it. We've asked an external person to look at it and also to look at to not just on a piece of paper, but actually what, what does it mean in the field? And is, are you comparing like with like there? And are there offsetting uh, arrangements going the other way? And that's what we're looking at, Senator. So, so thank you for raising those issues. We will we'll have to take them on notice. As these, you can these, are, these are substantial examples, numerous examples of where the rates are dropping up to, in some cases, um, by over 30 per cent. And you're saying to me that somehow this rate, when it was first struck, was not taking into account those substantial, the substantial differences, because these people are saying, as I said on the current affair program, as I've said publicly, that they have been receiving less payment, substantial less payment, and can't put food on the table. They're trying to run a small business, raise their family, keep the operation running properly, and provide a service to Australia that Australia needs. So they had no bargaining power, no bargaining in any of these rates being set. You, as the prime contractor, said, this is it, this is what the rate is and then hang the consequences. If there's enough complaining, we'll try to work out how we get around the edges. That's not what we're doing, Senator. We're, we are, as Catherine said, we are exactly looking at, uh, when, we look at the, when we look at the overall rates, we don't see that. So what we need to do is look at the, uh, is to an individual work, piece of work by piece of work and compare exactly what you're talking about. So it may be that it may be that those are slightly different pieces of work. It may be they're not, and that's the, exactly the exercise we're doing, Senator. So why why are NBN Co and its delivery partners cutting the payment rates of frontline technicians and small business contractors during a time when seventy-seven million dollars in corporate bonuses, funded by taxpayers, were handed out to by two NBN executives in late 2020? Well, we've, we've discussed the we've discussed the the incentive, the short-term incentive. I wouldn't call them bonuses, but the, the at-risk pay earlier. Um, what what we I think someone appears to have paid for it, haven't they? We, we take um, 
we, we, we take very risk. Or, uh, Sorry, Chair, I apologise. We take very seriously what you're talking about, Senator, I can assure you, and that's exactly why we're going through this methodical process to, to uncover exactly is, is, what you're, is what you're talking about at the, at the edge or is it, a, is it a prevalent issue? And we will, we will do that exercise. We are doing that exercise. So if payments to the frontline workers have been cut, who's taking the difference? You know, where are the profits going? Well, Sandra, I think, we, I think we addressed that earlier by saying that we have put in, in the meantime, a short-term um, uh, payment process which will more than cover any issues that you're talking about. Um, so, at, you know, we have, we have, what did you say, 1,800 people working in the field That's today doing, yeah. and we're, we're trying to help them be more and more productive so they get more and more jobs done, Sandra. So, Sorry, Mr. Ebert, but cutting yeah. them their rates by 30 per cent doesn't Senate, help them. I'm sorry, Central, that just simply doesn't compute. We have discussed this. We are doing, doing the exercise to see is that, is, is, is that a prevalent issue or is, and are you comparing uh, like with like? That's the exercise we're doing, Senator. And in the meantime, we're ensuring that there is no compensation issue for people who do work by putting this addition, additional fee in. So I'm trying to work out where all these profits are going. They're certainly not going in the pockets of small business people. So Ms Dyer, for the benefit of this committee and the Hansard record, can you explain what a prime is? A prime contractor. So we have our delivery partner and then a prime contractor could be an aggregator. Uh, they could then further subcontract into a delivery partner. So um, they could become a prime contractor. So, so why, do we, why do we need primes? So and you might explain what value they add to the whole system. Uh, so the, uh, you know, this is a large land that we operate a, a multi-technology mix in. So a delivery partner n might not be able to get all of their the skills and capabilities they need from uh, directly through one organisation. They therefore may go through another contracting organisation to get those specialist skills. That is, that's common in uh, certainly the telecommunications market. Ms Dyer, this, um, there's been a proliferation of, has been created which is, of these primes, which has created an unnecessary vacuum for new layers of subcontracting intermediaries. They're not subject to the same level of transparency or accountability for their conduct and treatment of workers. Now, is that correct? MBN's contract with our delivery partners clearly states that they must pay their subcontractors. Every, uh, like every invoice that they send MBN, they've got to make a declaration to how they're paying and how they're treating their workforce. So I would say that statement isn't correct. Well, can I just go to this then? There was a letter sent 18 days ago, uh, Mr. Rue, to you from the CPU raising some serious um, concerns. Um, and I note um, in, that, in those um, issues that were raised about misconduct, um, about inappropriate um, payment systems. But unfortunately, um, you've also in your opening statement in an issue that seems to be of great deal of concern to many of these small businesses, I note in your opening statement that unfortunately, and I'll read this, and I know you're aware of it, but unfortunately upon launching in New South Wales, some technicians have experienced reduced productivity schedules and work allocations, yep. resulting in longer waiting times to connect and assure appointments. Yep. Well, I would have thought one of the key issues that you'd be wanting to address here in an appropriate way in your opening statement is the fact that you're ripping off small contractors. Do you want to? Um, so again, Senator, I guess my offer to you is we have written to our delivery partners based off the concerns that we've heard from subcontractors. We've formally written to our delivery partners. We've met with them. We, we hear your concerns and we hear the concerns of the subcontractors. We've brought in an independent auditor to look at those two models because we don't see it at an aggregate. We don't see what your uh, what you're talking to us about. I would offer to you that uh, I have had subcontractors writing to me. If, if you are able to, or if you're the people that have written to you would like to contact us, we will include them in the review so they can give us information. But we're absolutely doing this, we're taking this very seriously and, and I do hear your concerns. 
Mr. Dyer, the, the having auditors um, doing a calculation on something that they probably already or somebody, another auditor already done, said this system's going to work, doesn't fill me full of confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, if it does fill me some confidence, that is, you'll get some figures, but nothing in those figures will demonstrate except an arbitrary decision by NBN on what they'll pay. Mm -hmm. They are not negotiations in those circumstances. You are using your market power and your market might to step on the necks of small businesses. That, that is absolutely not the intent of the review and the, the specific scope and the briefing I have given to the audit, uh, the auditors that are doing this is I want a line of sight traceability from the original contracts and the actual work activity. And if there was even any additional administrative duties that changed as part of that activity, I want the full comparison um, played out for me in a commercial rate. In addition to that, they will be doing field visits and they will be listening to subcontractors. So I, I would say that they're going to do a very thorough review and that's my expectations of them. Mr. Mr. Uh, yep. yep, Mr. Roo, um, I'll have other questions to ask on the subject, but this final question for this lot. Uh, do you agree with the assessment of the CPU and the MBN workforce that this chasm with prime contractors is now populated by cascading levels of unscrupulous, unhelpful and frankly dangerous intermediaries? Um, uh, what's the, what, what, I don't understand the basis here. Can you explain the basis, Senator, what you Well, mean the CPU that? has been uh, raising um, and wanting to meet with you um, for now 18 days to talk to the senior executive not to the people who set up the prime system or have got their futures based on whether the prime works or not, but you directly, mm -hmm. to talk about these un concerns about these unscrupulous um, operators. And as we've just seen... Yeah. And, and, and there, have been, there has been a uh, certain uh, piece of information passed on to my team, not Catherine's team, the, a, a separate team, who have... Uh, are, are in the process of investigating those centres. And what I can tell you is that if we are... Um, given things to investigate, we will investigate. That's who we are. We will do that. And, and you, you know, my, my team have sought information. I will also ask the same question when, when I meet. And if, if there are allegations made, we will follow that up. Thank That's you, who we Mr. are. That's why at the last hearing, Sandra, I, I encouraged people, actually, you can read the hands, hands are. I encourage people, if they had concerns, to write into us. Wouldn't it be more efficient for MBN Company to have a direct negotiation mm -hmm. engagement model with your primary delivery partners and the CPU? That, uh, that um, is would be unmanageable. That to have uh, for MBN yeah. to have a direct relationship with you know potentially two thousand, two and a half thousand, because not all techs work you know full time by choice. That would um, that would. Uh, that's just not common in uh, the telecommunications industry and certainly a lot of other adjacency industries. Yes, okay, I might give you. You a little, I'll give Senator you a little Shelby. hint. I'll give you a little hint. You might just respond to this and I'll, we'll finish with this. Is that there are things called unions. What you do is you actually go and have a group of workers that are, are re elected representatives to go and negotiate. What I'm asking, will you allow a group of workers through the negotiated organisation to turn around and, dis and negotiate with, with you, and I'll, I'll, same questions to uh, Mr. Rue, Look, obviously he's a senior player in this, uh, directly to negotiate regards to these rates. So the, the, our agreement, MBN's agreement, is with our delivery partner, and that's where our negotiation and our commercial arrangement exists. Thank I'll you, take that Mr. as a note. Um, I'm going to give the call to Senator Bragg. Just before I do, I just want to—I understand uh, NBN is a GPE, therefore you're exempt from the Commonwealth procurement rules, and you're expected to operate as a commercial entity. Some of the practices within government, though, and I look at defence, where they engage with a wide range of firms who provide services of individuals, including subcontractors, done on panel bases. Mm -hmm where the panel contracting arrangements have been looked at in depth in terms of profit margins and, and fairness skills, et cetera, um, to make sure that the Commonwealth is protected, mm -hmm. but it provides a low amount of administrative effort to engage someone, but you know that the contract is going to uh, be valued for money for all parties concerned. Uh, and you can take this on notice, but has NBN considered some of those kinds of models? 
uh, in terms of addressing the challenges that Ms Dyer's just outlined about the fact we're a broad country. Uh, well, that, uh, Sandra, in this specific example, that's exactly what we're doing. Because we, we, at the end of the day, the delivery partners are the ones who negotiate with the technicians. But we are, are, have actually taken exactly that exercise to see is the, is the payments that are being made equivalent, relatively equivalent, there'll always be ups and downs obviously, but relatively equivalent to the work that was done previously. And that's actually the exercise we're doing here. As a more broad point, Senator, we, we, we may, as a GBE, we, we obviously have a policy uh, implement policy and we obviously have to run ourselves a business but I can tell you um, that we treat every cent that we spend as taxpayers money every cent and therefore things like the procurement rules are very much guided by Commonwealth but they're not exactly the same but, but they are very much guided by the principles within within uh, procurement uh, Commonwealth procurement rules um, so in this example I suggest that's what we're doing chair but 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 thank you for your your We'll take your thought on board. Thank you. And if you could come back to me on notice, just yeah. to explain whether that that general model yeah, of, we can do that. of panels of providers yep. in terms of pre-agreed terms and conditions is something that maybe we we said. will take that on notice, and we will, uh, as a question chair, and we will um, lay out how we operate our procurement function, um, taking into account what you, what you've sure. just asked. Senator Brown. Uh, thanks, chair. Um, I'd like to ask some questions about the MBN's uh, network upgrades, and in particular the business fibre zone initiative. So, um, how do the network upgrades leverage the fact that the network build was completed in 2020? Do you, um, do you want to? Do you want to come to? I think it was business fibre zones. We talked to. We'll talk to. Um, um, Brad will answer those. Sorry, uh, Senator Brad, can you repeat your question again? Apologies. Um, how do the network upgrades leverage the fact that the network build was completed in 2020? Yeah. So I think, Senator, we, we, the, the, um, any telecommunication company mm. always evolves networks over time. And what, what we have done, um, in accordance with the statement of expectations given to us by the government, is to yeah. build a network out across the whole nation that delivers a certain minimum level of standards. Having done that, though, what, what we have done in, in, let's take the fibers of the node area, for example, we already have pulled fiber, typically a distance of 10, 11 kilometers from, yep, from the exchange to what's called a, 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 a fiber to the node or a node. So fiber to the node is fiber to a node. And in, within that node then is, a, is what's called a DSLAM that effectively turns the optical yeah. signal to a signal over the copper wire. The fact that we have built 10, 11 kilometres already means that there's only the last, what tip, they call the last mile, but it's call it a one or two kilometres of fibre to build from that node to outside people's homes. In other words, we are utilising existing infrastructure to continue to pull fibre deeper and then to offer individuals who want higher rates, oh, sorry, higher rate, been talking about rates, higher um, speeds. Um, to be able to order that. That's one example. In, in HFC, we have built, a, in, in a cable network, we have what's called a cable termination modem system in the CFS, cable modem termination system in the exchange that sends, again, a signal over the spectrum of HFC to people's homes. We're able to use that, and John can explain the detail, but we're able to yeah. use that to do some um, additional capacity, but also some work in the exchange to be able to deliver higher speeds. And similarly, on fibre to the curb, we already have fibre pulled deep outside someone's home. So now it's relatively cheap to, to give someone a fibre lead-in if, the, if, they, if they need a higher speed that we can do today. Um, similarly, with, with um, business fibre zones, we have fibre all over the country, and we're able to pull fibre again from interlock points, if you like, often, to, um, into um, areas where brand okay. can, can help our retailers sell to small business. So it's effectively a, um, no infrastructure has been thrown out. We're, we're building on top of what has already been built. Okay, and has any modelling been done on the economic benefits of the $4.5 billion network investment? Well, well, Senator, one of the things we did at the time of the, um, uh, at the time of um, discussing this with government, we did look at the benefits to the, um, Australia's yeah. economic, the economic impact on Australia by us and, and, and our promise to the Commonwealth 
is that we would build in every state and we would build in um, a certain percentage, you know, a high percentage in regional areas. And the, and the impact of that is is that that the GDP, we believe, benefit to the nation, mm. if I can just find it here. Um, boom, boom, boom. Yes, there it is. That it would create 25,000 jobs by 2022. In, right. It would create 10,000 jobs in regional Australia. It would lead to a GDP uplift of 6.4 billion by 2024. And in regional Australia, one and a half billion out of that 6.4. It would create 12,000 new businesses in Australia and help 2,800 new businesses be built in, um, in regional Australia. And that's no surprise, Senator, because that, that is direct work, but also indirect work. So direct build, but also the businesses that are built off that direct build. But on top of that, Senator, I think the, when, people, when people need have a need for higher speeds, um, which will grow over time, this will help the community drive more longer term economic benefit, more social equality, and also help us compete internationally. Okay, that's very useful, thank you. Um, what percentage of the network will be able to access speeds of one gigabyte? Okay, so by the time we get to um, uh, the end of calendar 2023, our current plan is that in the fixed line network, which is 90% of the country, that one in four, sorry, three in four of those homes, or seventy-five percent of those homes, would be able to get speeds. Up, will be able to purchase our highest speed tier. Right. Um, so, what do you say? Three in four. Three in four. Okay. So seventy-five percent. So that's yeah. so that's um, out of what ten, twelve, eleven million homes. That's almost eight million homes. In fact, it's just over eight million homes. It's more than eight million homes. We will be if they so choose to order a higher, our, our highest speed tier. Be able to yeah. do that. And in terms of that one gigabyte um, per second, um, how does that work on a personal basis? I mean, what does that mean for people at home? If they're having to work at home. We're about to have another lockdown in Victoria, I think. So it's quite a relevant question. Do you want to talk about that, Yeah, I might pick that up. And also, I think you had asked earlier about business fibre zones too, within the context yeah. of the you know the overall network investment that we've made and just to contextualize the business fiber zones that's really part of an overall commitment that we have to support all businesses across australia but in particular in the small and in the medium size um, from a volume perspective you really see that in our um, our so-called traffic class four our, co our core nbn offering where we've got more than a million businesses now that are being served by the nbn um, and many of these that are taking up speeds like the 140 or um, the, the 250, 100 are getting um, an absolute step change in the way they run their businesses compared to what they had before. Um, but even with all of that success on the TC4, we still see this um, strong pent up demand for a direct fiber solution that could give um, very, very high speed symmetrical services. So I'm talking about all the way up to a, a gig download, but also a gig upload um, and a roadmap all the way up to 10 gig in, in both directions. Um, but one of the, the blockers to that take up has been um, the build cost to be able to get that direct fiber out there. And as Mr. Rue just said, we've now yeah. got fiber out deeper into the, into the nation and we're able to leverage that. Um, the other one has been this um, tradition in the country of having so-called zone-based pricing, where mm -hmm. customers that live close to the central business districts get one price, yep. but when you get further and further away, that price goes up, and oftentimes dramatically, you pay twice as much if you're out in regional Australia as if you're in metro. Um, and that's just a, it's something that didn't seem fair to us and it wasn't consistent with the purpose of the NBN. So last September, we did launch what we were calling the business fiber zones. And this, yep. this really had three main elements. One was our and how many of those have you got? Pardon me? How many of those have you got? So we've got 240, 240 um, business, zones, business, business fiber, fiber zones. zones. Yep. Okay, um, and where are they? They're spread across the country, so we deliberately looked, you know, particularly, you know, more emphasis in the regional areas. Yeah. Um, this enables another 750,000 businesses, business prems, to be able to get CBD pricing, um, even though they might be, you know, way out in the regions. 
Um, and we now 90% of all business prems across the nation can order an enterprise Ethernet um, direct fiber service with no upfront build costs. So it's, it's very attractive to small and medium businesses in particular that are out in regions. As a result of that, we've actually seen um, the orders on business um, are on enterprise Ethernet more than double since we launched the business fiber zones. Uh, we've seen a significant uptick in those particular zones that we've carved out. And while you might think a gig gig, back to your question about the demand for higher speeds, that yeah. that would be really for sort of enterprise, large government applications, we're actually seeing the majority of those are coming on small and medium businesses, which is quite pleasing. So okay. we're, we're excited. It's still early days, um, but we're very excited about the progress for business fiber zones. So for a small or medium-sized business, what sort of, um, what sort of benefits are available? Yeah. Well, it depends. If you look at something like an architecture firm, they'll yeah. be moving very large um, computer-aided design files back and forth to yeah. say they're you know, from location to location or to their client. Uh -huh. So the ability to upload that very, very quickly, get the download and work on it would be one sort of a use case that we would see. You'd see the same thing in small regional medical offices where they might be taking scans and they mm -hmm. want to be able to send those to potentially to a specialist in a metro area for review. They can move those scans. And, and, are those real examples you're using? I mean, Absolutely. That, that, that's a sort of clientele you've got, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, you think of a scan, it's no longer a static image now. Typically, it would be some sort of almost like a, it would look like a video, but it's an extraordinarily high definition. And for medical purposes, it has to be precise. So that's where you really get the benefit of that large, symmetrical, dedicated fiber. Okay. There's been some discussion about uh, CBD equivalent pricing. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? So um, again, historically, there were we the, the country was basically set up in zones, and so a CBD area, and I think it because in the, in the early days it might have been just cheaper to build there, they would get a, one price, and then as you got further and further away, the actual price that you pay for the service every month would be higher, and it was just as a matter of course. It was like here's the CBD, then you're in zone one, you're in zone two, three. And with our business fiber zones, we've flattened that. So if you're in one of those 240 zones, you will get the CBD pricing, even if you are in a, you know, a relatively remote okay. location, which is, which is a great value. So you could be in any of one of those 240 zones. That's right. And you get CBD pricing. Is that right? Yeah. OK. That's good. My last question is, um, yeah, just, I mean, what sort of, like, can you put some examples on the table, some meat on the bones of what, what sort of savings that means for a business to get access to that in the push? Well, the first would be the, the cost of the, the, the build in the first place. And for, for some, it just would be prohibitive. Like you couldn't get a, a telco yeah. to come out there and, and actually build a direct fiber to your location. Um, and now we're in a situation where, um, because we've got fiber deeper, 90% of all businesses in the nation um, can get that build um, for free, no upfront charge. Yep. And then the second is the, the ongoing charge because our wholesale rate is now flattened. Um, and if you were in one of the farther out zones, it could have been your wholesale rate would have been double what it is in the CBD. Is that right? And now we brought it all the way down to the CBD. So it's just substantial ongoing savings as well. Very good. Um, thank you for answering all my questions. Thank you. Senator yes. Shilton. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Dyer, if she's... Thank you. Ms. Dyer, just, just, I've just been thinking about a question the Chair asked before, which was um, uh, constructive, of course. Um, but one of the things that was raised um, was about you know, what is a, a fit rate to be paid. Are you able to give me the calculations that you use on for compensation for capital investment by technicians, um, the calculation you use for labour return, and the calculations you use for the costs of running the business? We wouldn't, we don't calculate that. That is something for the delivery partner to consider and calculate as they submit pricing to MBN. That's not something we would be submitting. Um, or reviewing ourselves. So when you set the rates, you don't build in to see whether there's a capital return? 
whether there's labour return or whether there's ongoing costs return for the um, small business so, operator. So in, um, I guess, a RFP process, we would give the description of the activity and the expected outcome uh, to the delivery partner, and we would ask them in their considered experience with their industry experience, we would ask them to consider those things in the rates that they give back to us to perform the activity. Ms Dyer, can I just give you an example of where market power is misused? Um, Coles, which have subsequently, many a number of years ago, rectified this problem to their credit, um, but certainly to the credit of the Shop Assistance Union, you know, one of those unions that represent groups of people, mm -hmm. and sometimes even do it for contractors to make sure that people get a voice, and there's some even bargaining power. They raised with Coles because there was a number of companies that were being used under the exact same circumstances that you have just explained to me, but in this case, they were actually uh, trolley workers. Mm -hmm. They were getting paid as little as $4 an hour. Now, what I'm, if you don't set what the capital investment return should be, or the labour return should be, or the cost, ongoing cost of the business should be for those technicians, and what is a fair rate to be able to get a proper return on that, then you are not actually oversighting anything other than getting the lowest rate through your uh, market power and through the overarching way that you can, the big, you know, the, the gorilla goes to the, goes to the others and says, you know, this is the rate you're going to get. I don't calculate how much food you need. I don't calculate what you need to sustain yourself. I don't calculate what it takes to actually get the work done. But this is the rate I'm going to give you. Aren't you operating like the gorilla in the circumstance? Our, our expectation is our delivery partners are operating within uh, all the laws of the land, and that they are taking those things into consideration. So we're, we're very much uh, looking to our delivery partners and we've got within our contracts, we've got rights to audit, rights to govern uh, different processes and we do that from time to time with them. But do you not order, sorry, sorry, just to get to the question, Stuart. Does the contractor have the right to audit? No, many of your clients. Stuart, if it's okay, I just want to go to the specific part, but you don't actually turn around and say what that, you do an audit, but you don't have a rate on what the proper return be, should be for labour costs. It, it, I guess it's a supply and demand. Sorry, yes or, yes or no. I mean, I'm, our, I appreciate our, you, you've got a reason why you do it. I'm just asking whether you do do a rate of return for labour costs when you set a rate for those technicians through the, uh, whether it be through the primes or not. Our, our agreement is with the delivery partner who would be considering those types of commercial models in so their the, response to What are you auditing? NBN. Pardon? Uh, uh, sorry, I want, I want that open question. So you aren't auditing capital costs, labour costs and ongoing costs of the business. You are doing some audit, whatever that is, it's a bit mysterious because you can't actually benchmark it. And the similar situation happened with Coles with the trolley workers and eventually that was rectified. I want to ask this question, um, what margin do the owners of Primes keep for themselves when they receive a payment for a job from the delivery partner? Pardon? Uh, that, that, um, that agreement between a delivery partner and their contracting workforce is an agreement between them. And I would like to also point out a number of our delivery partners do have direct techs that work directly for their organisation as well. So it's not just a subcontracting environment that exists in, um, in our contracts. I, I, I don't have any problems with subcontractors or contractors. In actual fact, that makes the world go round. I'm, I have problems about the fact they're getting ripped off and they can't turn around and get proper return for their labour, let alone anything else, and the NBN doesn't care. Now, I've heard in, uh, that it's, uh, for the primes that the rate that they skim off the top from primes, this new layover you've put in, can be as high as 30%. Is that correct? We haven't put a new layer in. I think, and I think what you're uh, alluding to there is, in some instances, some of our delivery partners are using prime contractors who then subcontract. That is entirely up to our delivery partners. And as I said, that the delivery partners must comply with the laws of the land. And we're very considerate in the way that we engage with our delivery partners. But the, but the laws of the land don't stop them from charging 30%, does it? Should it? But does it? It doesn't, does it? I can't answer that question. I'm, so I apologise. you do an audit, but you don't know the answer to whether the primes are ripping off subcontractors on labour rates, taking too much off the top of the contract, 
uh, not giving capital return, not giving on cost return. Now, if you have new layers of subcontracting entities, doesn't it inevitably mean that more people are taking a cut and less money flowing through to the people actually doing the work? Again, I, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. So can I, can I then put it to a different way? You pay a rate, let's just say it's, a, it's you know, this figure doesn't exist as far as I'm aware, there's a rate, say $100. Somebody bids for that contract and says, right, oh, well, I'll do it, you know, I'll do it for $90. You might say it's actually cost really $100, but they're prepared to do it for 90 That's their problem. I'm going through what I expect MBM to be, to be approaching it, the way you've been explaining to them this morning. So you've got one layer. They're doing it for 90 The next layer says, look, I really can't do it for 90 I've got to find somebody else who's going to do it for less. So then they go and turn around and say, because I've done all this, you know, um, I've entrepreneurially decided that I'm going to rip people off, I'll get somebody else to take the blame and take the responsibility. So then they subcontract it. Someone takes another slice of the action. And they subcontract it and someone else takes a slice of the action. Don't you think people take a slice of the action when you subcontract in that frame? Look, uh, the, that model you've described, again, that our agreement is with a delivery partner. And what occurs from there, and I'm just going to give an example, even though uh, this is a delivery partner engaging with the market, is often those prime contractors will do a number of administrative duties, a number of insurances, et cetera, for other subcontractors. So they're performing a, a function, if you like, for their subcontractors working for them. That's how generally the model works. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it, this is a, a well-known industry practice across multiple industries and not just telecommunications. Well, well I'm, getting, I'm getting to my point about um, that is a there's no auditing of actual processes here. The, the, the industry does it. People just get ripped off. And those coal trolley work, coal's trolley workers got ripped off too. That's just the market. So when I ask this question, do you have mechanisms to, in place to track the volume of payment clawbacks being exercised by primes and delivery partners? We have the ability to, we, we have the ability to audit what we're paying our delivery partners and if there's a discrepancy with our delivery partners. The, our contractual obligation or arrangement with the delivery partner is to make sure, and they, like I said, they provide a declaration that they are fairly paying their subcontracting environment. So that's effectively the mechanism. And if I, I can just mention, again, on the audit principle, we do do very robust audits, but they are with the delivery partner. And they're, they, you know, they're based on compliance and governance around health and safety, the quality of the work, and the commerciality of our contracts. So you don't do audits about what they're getting paid and whether it's a sustainable rate to their business or they're getting returned for labour? We expect, we expect that to No, no, no. Do, we, do you do an audit on that? That's the question we, I'm asking. We, our commercial relationship is with our delivery partner. So you don't do, um, no, you, you say you do a auditing on the processes. Do you do an auditing on the labour and the return that's paid for labour and for the ongoing cost, capital costs and ongoing business costs? Do you do an audit on that? We audit the contract that we have with our delivery partner. That's does, it, does it include, well, I'll ask you, does it include a audit of the labour costs, the ongoing um, costs for the business, the capital costs, and a return um, that's sustainable? Do you audit that? That's a matter for the delivery partner right. and so their you, I take that you don't order it. So we've got a, so we've got, haven't we really got, you know, aren't you really I'm, saying to me that we've got a, governance problem here. And, and Senator, sorry. Because we can't contact there. There's a sharp, there's a sharp rise in baseless clawbacks and the reasons underpinning this is still not clear. Senator, if I could just add, this, this, we haven't changed the model. The model's existed since the, you know, 2010 when NBN was first created, just to be clear, in case you thought we had. I don't know whether you thought we had or not, but I'll, we have got a temporary glitch. There's, there's no doubt with the which, why, which is why it's in the opening statement. But we haven't changed. We haven't changed how the telecommunication industries work. It's been like this for, for 10 years. And if anything, Senator, we have more governance than ever. Mr. Just the, 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 Mr. The, Mr. Rue, I appreciate the fact that you've, um, you've outlined that to me, that it's been happening for a very long time, including under your leadership. No, I have, what I'm raising is concerns about the fact that there is not, um, how can we possibly perform governance and how can we detect when there is a sharp rise in baseless clawbacks and the reasons underpinning this? 
Have we got a, a governance system that does that? Okay. You're in the hot seat, not your predecessors, Mr. Roo. No, I appreciate that. I just, I just didn't, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to give you the impression, in, in case you had it or any senators had it, that the the Unify program had changed anything in terms of arrangements. And and we are absolutely at our behest looking at the the rate comparison to the previous rate comparison. Uh, sorry, to previous rates of the previous contract. That that was purely the point I was making, Senator. In terms of your specific question, Catherine. Um, it is a bit repetitive. I, I apologise for my answer, but we have a very a very, what I would say, a very good and robust governance process with our delivery partners in relation to their uh, contracts with the MBN and how they perform under the contracts with us. Can you, can, can you, who keeps the money when there is a clawback? The prime delivery partner or MBN Co? That if there's a clawback back that the delivery partner has uh, conducted with a um, with one of their subcontractors. That's not visible to MBN. So, so it's not, not even visible. So what assurance mechanisms do you have in place to ensure clawbacks aren't being pocketed by primes or delivery partners? Do you have a so, system? So we, we do have a contractual term in our contracts with our delivery partners about the payment of their subcontractor uh, workforce. There is a direct obligation on them in relation to that. But you don't audit, you don't audit the, so, no, the actual rates they get paid. You've already given that evidence. Senator, if concerns are raised with us, I assure you we follow them up. And we have, and we have in our contracts the right to audit. So in the event that a specific concern is raised, we will raise that with the delivery partner. And if, if, the, if it's not satisfied, we have the right to go and audit that. And we do do audits from time to time. Um, can I just, if I've got this straight, yep. you do audits. Yep. You do not do audits of whether people are getting a labour force return for their labour. Their labour. That. That's you don't do an audit of. of yeah, one okay. You don't do an audit to see whether there's a proper capital return. You don't do an audit to say if there's ongoing costs, and you don't do an audit about these clawbacks in a way about when there's they could be as high as thirty percent because no one knows what you have not. Other than what I've said to you, there's, you're not suggesting that that's an inaccurate figure. Well, what, what I'm saying is, is that uh, what Catherine said a few times here is that our contract is with the delivery partner. However, in the event that there are concerns raised with us that were not satisfied as being addressed by our delivery partner, we have the right to order those concerns. Can, they, can you order primes? I, Underneath the delivery part, we we can. I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. Let me just check that. Well, Mr. Dyer, you, you, you've you're head of the auditing and accountability process. Um, you've given us. Uh, you said that we've got a, you've got a robust system. Um, I've obviously, I've questioned how robust it is, but you've stood by that being a robust system. Can you audit primes? I'll, we'll come back to you in relation to, I guess, the, our investigative powers uh, in relation to our contract with the delivery partners. It's against the so contract. you don't know? Mm. Is it it's what you're saying to me at this point? I appreciate you taking on notice at this point, you don't know. Let me, let me take that, your specific question, notice. But we, and the reason is because we, we have a right to audit against any terms in the contract, so it depends what's in the contract. That's why I'm taking on notice, Senator. Thanks, Senator. Um, Senator Kitching, were you second the call? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, have, how are we going on the band zero to 100? I have the answer for you. I, don't have, the, so I don't have the zero to 50 and the 50 No, to no, no, that's sorry. OK. I'll take the zero to um, 100. So I've been advised. So um, for 30 June 2019, there was 1,855 employees. Sorry, 1,855 yeah. employees that had a, a base salary of less than or equal to 100, 100,000, obviously. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. And for 30 June 2020, that number was 1,761. 1,761 yep. at and, what, at, but, sorry, but, at what date? <clears throat> sorry, at, at, for, what? at 30 June 2020. Um, and, but to be, to be, um, for total clarification, that does include 
some workers that had, would have had a salary, a base salary of over 100,000, but they don't work full time. So, okay, um, yeah, so they're part, yes. Yeah, so it's, so if you're on a hundred, if you're on 150,000, you work yeah. three days, or whatever that, that yes. math okay. adds up to. At Can 90, I? 90. So Were any of those right. workers eligible for um, the bonus payments or the I, I don't, I, I don't, know, well, sorry, the answer to your question, Senator, is what was in the, the one that the Minister was tabling earlier. Yeah, thank you. So um, we will... Could, could I just... Quick, can I ask just a quick question? It's very, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Have you ever audited a prime before? And if so, how many? Well, look, I'll, I'll have to take that on notice. So, one of my team may have the answer for you, Senator. Thank you, you can come back to me. Do you have one last question, Senator Kitching, and then I'm going to go to Senator McMahon. Uh, okay. Well, you've <laughs> I, mean, had, I always have been. The, the opposition's had a 15-minute yeah, yeah. block, so. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask, Mr. Rue, are you able to give me a breakdown of those uh, of the 1,761 at 30 June 2020? Um, just how many are part of uh, sort of non-FTEs? Are you, do you think you'll be able to do that? No, I mean, I don't need it now, but if you could take it on notice. Um, yeah, you're, you're, and, you're. and the other thing I just want to ask you, actually, I'll just leave it there, Chair, yeah. and I'll come back. You're keeping our team busy, but I'm sure they can do it. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? You're keeping the team busy, but I'm sure they can do it. Oh, th oh thank you, team, who are listening. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Senator McMahon, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, Mr. Rue, I'd like to ask some questions about how uh, NBN Co and the network provide support during natural disasters. Yeah. Um, I understand that NBNCO helped to respond to the recent cyclone in WA. I think yeah. it was Cyclone Saroja. Yeah. Um, can you advise the committee how NBNCO assisted? Yeah, we'd love to. Um, specifically with, with regards to Geraldton. I'd love to, and Geraldton specifically, John. I'm sure you know the answer, so. Yeah, Geraldton, <coughs> Geraldton um, obviously took the full force of the cyclone. Um, we've got, um, we've got a, a satellite gateway in, um, in Geraldton. Um, that, Gerald, that, uh, that gateway was also affected by significant power loss in that area, but we switched the traffic to the other parts of the network um, to support that community. Um, what we also did is we deployed um, one of our SkyMaster trucks into that location as well. And um, because there was a loss um, of power for, sig for a significant period in that area, um, the uh, local community, and particularly the media as well, tethered to our SkyMaster uh, Sky truck so they could actually um, connect with uh, communities beyond, um, beyond the cyclone zone. So we were heavily involved there. We actually, it's the first time as well um, in, um, in NBN's history that we actually restored our network before local power was restored. Um, and I think that's testament to how we've um, engineered the network over many years um, for, uh, for, such, for such events. But we were very, very active and, um, and we were supporting the community all the way through. Thank you. And in, in general, um, how did the network respond to the impact of the cyclone? Yeah, uh, um, the network responded very well. And we, we, um, the network is architected so that we do have the ability to move traffic to uh, to um, other elements if there's if there's risk, and particularly the Geraldton Poi, uh, the Geraldton Gateway, I should say, was uh, was our biggest challenge. Um, um, but even though that satellite gateway is actually based in Western Australia, um, we carry traffic by nature of the satellite network for different parts of, the, of Australia through that gateway. Um, so we shuffled the traffic. Um, and, uh, and we didn't see any significant negative experience. Um, obviously, the community was devastated with, um, uh, with the size of the cyclone. Power was unquestionably the biggest issue, um, but uh, our response was very much um, um, in line with, um, with getting our services up and working. And uh, again, you know, as I said, it's the first time we'd ever put restored services from MBN before uh, even local power had been reprovided. So uh, we, were, we were very pleased with the outcome and, and being able to help the community uh, with such um, assets as the as Sky Muster truck was, uh, was a big contribution as well. And thank you for doing that. 
Um, can you tell me what steps, if any, did you undertake to prepare for and minimise the impact? Yeah, we um, <clears throat> we we have um, we have a significant continuity planning and um, emergency planning. Uh, we we drive that through right across the company. Um, but from a network point of view, we uh, we model the onset of. Um, such events as cyclones. Um, we pre-prepare by deploying generators into areas where we believe there will be power loss because uh, the, um, the core network is an active network as well. So, uh, you know, power is an important asset for us. So we, uh, we pre-plan, um, we work with all emergency services um, across the nation. Uh, and it's a complex task that um, but we have uh, wonderful relationships with the emergency services groups um, and local power authorities. Um, and so we, uh, we pre-deploy generators, we pre-deploy workforce, um, and what we do do is we also make sure that um, our traffic conditions on the network are being managed and we make contingencies within the core that if we have to create diverse and alternate routes, then, then, we, uh, then we certainly do that. So you will actually monitor uh, forecasting and um, and react and act accordingly yeah, very um, much to so. prepare for. Very much so. I mean, we um, you know, when you when you have a cyclone, you can you, you do have time to prepare for those. Uh, they don't just arrive. Yeah. And so uh, we, in all of our contingency planning, do prepare very effectively. Um, we 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 use. We use data such as the Bureau of Meteorology. We yeah. have a very close connection there. And we also um, extend that data modelling um, with other uh, sophisticated platforms. And we've, in, funnily enough, been uh, using data sets, particularly from the CSI in recent times, in predicting um, the propensity of lightning and the impact that could have on our network right across the nation. So we are very, very proactive. And, um, and like all uh, major telco networks, it's um, uh, being prepared through to manage through seasonal variation uh, is really important for us and it's a, it's a core discipline of our operations teams. So do you have um, someone specifically within BOM that reports to you? Or? No, we, we um, within the BOM mm. directly, we, we just have relationships in there and we use their data, but it's just one input. Uh, we run effectively a, a very large network operations centre that monitors all elements of our network. Uh, it's based out of Melbourne. And, um, and that group um, has an emergency response team um, so that we we uh, prepare all year for every possible event. And I think just beyond the cyclone in Western Australia, we were, uh, if I think back um, to the bushfires, we were, uh, we were very, very active in, uh, in the response of all the communities who were affected by the bushfires uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, and that, that brings me on to what, what other sort of natural disasters do you prepare for and how do you go about that? Yeah, we... Um, we prepare pretty well for everything, um, for every level of flood, famine and pestilence that we could be provided with. Um, we, we engineer the network um, with a number of things in mind. Certainly, uh, certainly power is one. Uh, flooding conditions, um, so we, um, in, in areas where we have um, significant risk of flooding, we even elevate parts of our network to protect um, those communities. Um, certainly, um, say power generation, um, we have lots of relationships with um, not only with our own generators, but also with organisations to provide power to us in, 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 in times of need. Um, we, again, monitor the network 24 hours a day and, and we overlay that network with a whole suite of complex data that, um, that predicts weather conditions. Uh, um, we're working through you know, quite a, a complex issue at the moment as we've been dealing with um, the FTTC challenge that uh, Mr. Rue mentioned at the, um, in, in his opening address is um, we're using lightning modelling so that we can understand the propensity of lightning and looking at lightning in relationship to the resistance of earth as well, um, so that we know the conditions of our networks and how they're likely to perform. So the more predictable and proactive we can be, the less disruption that we can, uh, then our customers will then experience. 
Um, do you utilise the uh, NAFI, North Australia Fire and Rangelands Information Site yeah. at all? We, we um, I, I would double check that. I'm pretty sure we do, but I will check that for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, who's after the call? If not, we can always adjourn. Yes. <laughs> We've got so many questions, we're just trying Senate, to sort out. Senator Sheldon, you have... so intensely listening to um, those questions and answers. My apologies. I was, <laughs> You're yeah. blushing, Senator Sheldon. Ruminating yeah. the call. Yeah, I know, probably have. <laughs> um, the, the BCA made the following statement five months ago, and I would like to like uh, MBN to confirm whether the statement is accurate from an, from an NBN perspective. BCA are pleased to confirm it has secured a significant long-term agreement with NBN for unified field operations, bracket services, for four years, with potential two by two by two year extension options each at NBN's election. Announced on the ASX yesterday, the contract was signed on the 16th of December 2020 and will commence in March 2021. Tim Harris, CEO of BSA Limited, said, we are extremely proud to have secured this contract and continue our long-standing collaborative partnership with MBN. And went on further to say, BCA has been initially allocated regions across New South Wales and Victoria with additional regions allocated at MBN's discretion. Is that, is that information accurate? Uh, I think it's BSA, not BCA. Um, uh, BSA, yeah. yeah. That, uh, that was me misreading it. Oh, no, no, that's OK. You had me curious for a minute there. Um, the BSA are one of our delivery partners and they do, uh, they do have contracts with MBN under Unify. And that's, those contracts are potentially up to for an eight-year agreement? There's optionalities. In the initial term of the agreement, there's options to extend. And, and what's the um, when when does the extension question come into play, <coughs> and what and how long is the extension potentially? Be? Due, due to the complexity of the arrangement, and as you can imagine, it's not wouldn't be easy to change delivery partners. We actually start looking at that probably about two years before the the first uh, I guess um, trigger point, and we'd look at it more closely about a year out. Right, so, so they could extend uh, up to an eight year agreement under those circumstances? Uh, I need to check that exact term, if it is a plus four or if it's often they're like plus two, plus two or something. Plus four is unusual, so I would like to check that. So it might be like incremental add-ons rather than the four plus four, so I would need to check. If you can come back to me, help. is there someone here that can give you the answer on that? Or? Uh, yeah, there should be, hopefully, someone there on. Are, there yep. are people listening, Senator. Yep. And thank you. If they... Mr. Rue, I want to begin by discussing, thank you, if you could take that on notice and people can bring it back as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rue, I want to begin with discussing the dodgy contracts being used to exploit MBN technicians and small business contractors across the country. Specifically, I would like to begin by exploring the BSA services contract and the so-called termination clauses. Has, has your company reviewed these clauses? The, the, the clauses between BSA and... The termination clause, uh, sorry, regarding the termination clauses, yes. Between BSA and NBN? Yeah. Yes, they would. Uh, we absolutely would have. And... Catherine, do you want to add to that? Uh, so, in relation to our expectations with the delivery partner, uh, we do set out very clearly to uh, our delivery partners in our contracts about, um, you know, allowing other subcontractors to work for other uh, contractors in the market. So we're very clear about that. In relation to the termination rights, that is, that would be an agreement between the commercial agreement between the delivery partner and the subcontractor. Uh, so you're not talking about between NBN well, and... Well, I was talking about both, but that's, oh, okay, that's, sorry. that's good. So uh, uh, Ms Dyer actually explained... Sorry, because that's question. why I asked you, was it NBN? You sorry. did, and you, and you answered Thank what you. I said, and yep, Ms Dyer you. also yep. added, added in, which was very helpful. Thank you. Now, a review of these contracts indicates the termination provisions make it easy for BSA to terminate, and by contrast, makes it very difficult for the technician or small business contractor to terminate. The agreement is also allows for BSA, upon termination, to retain significant amounts of money owing to the contractor 
and to unreasonably limit its ability, liability to the contractor. Would you consider if that's the case, that would be standard practice? Uh, I, how I would answer that is I would say, again, our contract is with the delivery partner and we have, we ask the de delivery partner to make a declaration in, in relation to when we pay them that, that they are paying their workforce and we are, our expectation contractually is they are complying with the law. Is there any intention to extend the auditing process to be able to look at that specific question? Uh, the, I've just received a just a general comment in relation to our, I guess, our audit scope and what contractually we can audit. And uh, we, it, again, it depends on the contract, but generally speaking, unless it's stated in our contract, we generally don't audit our prim audit primes that work for delivery partners. And the reason for that, if I can just talk at a practical level, is when we engage with a delivery partner, they may decide to go out and recruit 500 people directly. They may decide to go out and you know, uh, partner with another delivery partner. We, we don't know what they're going to do. That is up to them to determine how they're going to deliver our scope of work. Well, well we, do, we do know that when the rate's low, people get paid less, and when they subcontract in a, in a supply chain and subcontract and subcontract for essentially the same work, that the rate drops. We know that happens. And there isn't an audit process that d deals with that. And thank you. you can, you've answered that in previous previous questions. Now, the agreement allows BCA, um, upon uh, termination, as I said before, about holding significant amounts um, of money owing. Now, I just want to go to a further example. The BCA services agreement continued in operation until it is terminated. Clauses in the contract provide that BCA may terminate that contract at any time and in its absolute discretion, without cause. This is referred to a termination of convenience. Well, certainly convenient to BSA. In this situation, BSA determines for itself what, if any, period of notice it provides to a small business contractor. Now, here's the key point. If BSA does terminate under this mechanism, it retains the right to retain all owed payments to the contractor at that time for a period of 60 business days. Do you consider that acceptable? Again, that is an agreement between, uh, I, I'm not, I don't have visibility of that agreement and I, you know, the only thing I could suggest there if I was that subcontractor myself, I would absolutely escalate that with BSA and consider how I report that out with them. Uh, may I uh, yeah, yeah, follow sorry, up? Yeah. Thank you, yeah. um, Senator Sheldon, because you spoke about very strongly about your so-called audit processes, uh, but if a contractor, for example, had concerns about the work of their prime, do you think they'd be able to tell you about it? We do have whistleblower cases that come mm. into MBN on various matters. Okay, but in that context of these kinds of contract negotiations and agreements, uh, Let's, let's go through some of those dynamics. Um, and Senator Sheldon spoke very clearly about the re retaining of payments. If you had a sham contract designed to exploit technicians and small business contractors, and you want to impose a high cost and have tools to financially intimidate anyone who dares to try and leave that sham contract arrangement, is that not the kind of tool that a prime or delivery partner would want? And you would have no idea whether these things are embedded in their contracts. We you? explicitly have in our contracts our, uh, with our delivery partners a no sham contracting clause, and it's explicit in our rights for uh, termination under certain conditions for breach of that contract. It is also uh, gives us right of audit, further audit in relation to that as well, and it's very explicit in terms of our um, expectations of our delivery partners. Yes, your expectations of your delivery partners give your delivery partners a huge amount of latitude to exploit their subcontractors. For example, a technician or small business contractor, they might want to terminate uh, if BSA has not uh, paid them an owed amount, uh, if they've given notice, 
gives 30 days to pay, gives BSA a second notice to pay and advises that it intends to terminate if BSA fails to pay and BSA still fails to pay that amount. You'd be concerned about that, wouldn't you? Yes, as, but you, do you, as you've think, outlined it, you would. Do you think you would actually know if that were the case? <laughs> no, it's not hypothetical because I can tell you exactly what happens because uh, the subcontractor has much more limited circumstances under which they can terminate a contract, but the prime and your delivery partner can terminate the contract without notice and without reason. So do you think they're going to get any further work Senator, if they seek to take these issues up? Do you think they can afford to tell you what's wrong with the things that have been delivered uh, by the delivery partner and how their work's been managed? Do you think they can tell you about uh, where uh, customer problems that they've experienced as a subcontractor might actually be the responsibility of the prime? I don't think they can tell you because if they do, their contracts can just be cut off like that. Have you looked at those dynamics at all? We, within our, so again, our agreement is with our delivery partner. Mm. There is a declaration. A, a, a legal declaration they make to us when we pay them about the payment of their workforce. So there's a legal obligation between the two parties at that But can you not see how you can stretch that legal obligation right to the very, very limit because your legal obligation doesn't cover the fact that the primes can terminate for any reason at any time? These negotiations are implicitly integrated, like the negotiating power of Senator Sheldon has highlighted, highlighted any number of times, does not lie with the subcontractor in these circumstances, does it? The, uh, again, the, the subcontractors can go and work for other delivery partners, and this is, a, this is a very common model in utilities and all other spaces within uh, the workforce. This is not something, as Stephen said, that we've thought of just in the last six yeah, months. Yeah, but we're not talking about a construction project down the road building a tunnel versus a hospital down the street where there are different... We're talking about a monolith that is the NBN. You can go and work for a delivery partner with exactly the same dynamic. You are a monopoly at the top, in large part, uh, with subprimes who essentially um, impose the same kind of conditions. It's an absolute recipe for a race to the bottom. The, the idea of competition that you've introduced, it, it does not seem robust at all that the labour agreements have any power even to move to another prime. We haven't introduced the Senator, this is an industry, it's not just the telecommunication industry, it's, it's across broader utilities who also do, don't just build but also do the sort of services Catherine's talking about. We haven't introduced anything new. Different to them. You know, essentially you're just saying, yes, we understand, Senator Pratt, no. you're actually correct, but that's the way the world no, works and saying, we don't care. No, that's not true, Senator. And I, I, I offered on the last hearing, and I offer again, that if there are specific examples that can be given to us... If you'd we, met with the union before now, you would have had the specific examples, but you haven't Senator, met with Senator, my them. team have met with the union, but the, and, I am, and I am meeting with, with um, Jane in, in coming time. But, but Senator, the... What, what, what I said is that we, we do have a whistleblower line that, we, that can be used confidentially. And if things are brought to our attention, we will investigate. Mm. And I've said that before and I'll say it again. So it's not true okay, well, we don't care. Uh, I've, I seem, you said last time you'd investigate it and clearly you've come some way down the road, you've acknowledged some of these issues, but the blindness in the way you manage your contracts, when last time we raised these issues, you simply said, well, we don't have purview because it's underneath our primes and their subcontracts. You don't have purview. We, and, and so finally, you went away to look at it. And here now, you're finally starting to acknowledge at the very fringes that some of these issues and, are real. And our delivery partners have, have obligations to us under the law centre as well. And they are, you know, we're very important. But only if the subcontractors that work for those delivery partners you know, they're, ob they're only going to meet their obligations if they're, they're forced to do so. 
your subcontractors, your primes have their delivery obligations, and that's what you've emphasised, not the obligations of those primes to their subcontractors. Uh, in that context, I want to refer to a letter that you've received from Shane Murphy, the president of the CEPU, and it asserted workers are being subjected to arbitrary switching off without notice, explanation of proper cause, often even workers' families in financial ruin, having to sell their vehicles and equipment, crueling any opportunity to re return to the industry. Most concerning, this appears to be happening where workers question their mistreatment and or underpayment. These profoundly disturbing behaviours are completely unacceptable in a public infrastructure project. No worker should fear retribution for exposing wrongdoing. Do you believe workers should fear retribution for exposing wrongdoing? Senator, what, what um, my team has done is ask Mr Murphy for some details on that, and I will do that as well. And, you know, we, we you know, the, the organisation we are, we, we, we care about the country. That's why we're here. We also care about people in the country. And if there are, sorry, Senator, if I can finish, if there are issues that can specifically, and they need to be specific, but they can be brought to our attention, we are, we are happy through our management teams, through our whistleblower, through raising it with the delivery but, partners, we're but happy Mr. to do that. But Mr Rui, that might well be the case, but unless you're prepared to override the terms of these contracts, you're simply agreeing with the status quo. We, we, because, as Ms Dyer has said, if it's legal contract law, then that's between the primes and their subcontractors. And that's at the heart of what we're talking about. So our, our obligation is to ensure that our, that our delivery partners are complying with the law in the event that there are other things brought to our attention about law not being complied with, we're, we're, we, I, as I said to you multiple times, we are happy to look at that. But These are legal contracts that exploit they, workers. They need to be specific examples. So, so just for sake Mr Rue, if those contracts exploit the small business, and they might be technically um, legal then, um, but you don't check them anyway, if they're technically legal that's okay, but you don't check them. So how, how can you know whether these um, arrangements that are being entered into by these primes meets legal status regarding return on capital, regarding the sham contracting, if you're not doing specific auditing? Cause, cause and, and I just raised, sorry, no, sorry, I just raised this last um, question in that. It does seem to me that you're proposing that people should, and, and, and make, obviously make comment about this, you're proposing that individuals, with all the weight against them, with all the capacity for the prime to turn around and victimise them under the legal contract, with all that going on, that somehow that would be different to what happened with Coles. And the reason I'll explain Coles again and the trolley, trolley workers, because Coles used to say, oh, come and make a complaint to me and we'll fix it because we're decent people. I'm not suggesting they weren't decent people. But I tell you what, it never got fixed because it couldn't get fixed, because you have to have it turn around and do the system in a very different way. You have to have proper audits, you have to have representation, and yeah, funnily right. enough, you have negotiations with rights. Can I ask, please, uh, Mr Rue, do prime entities, would you have any awareness of them coordinating among themselves to enforce provisions within their own contracts, put in common provisions, et cetera, within a state? Ms. Dyer, you've said someone can leave and go and work for another contractor, but they all have fairly, you know, what if it becomes apparent that they all have fairly similar clauses? Does that potentially constitute cartel like behaviour being used to control labour supply for the purposes of exploiting technicians and suppressing wages? Mm. Uh, Senator, I'm not a lawyer by any means, uh, and again, as I've said a number of times today, the, our agreement is with the delivery partner. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Well, we, we, we know that's what you... But it, essentially you say your agreement's with the delivery partners and you would not know if they were operating in a cartel-like fashion. Our, our would you know if they were operating in a cartel-like fashion? Our contract with our delivery partner is very, very clear in our expectations of the laws that they comply to and how they comply to them. How so many of your crimes, therefore, have provisions within their clauses with subcontractors 
that allow for termination without grounds and without notice? We don't uh, observe the contract yeah, between okay. the... So the liability provisions following a termination of convenience which you recall was the mechanism to fire someone without cause or notice and retain monies for 60 days. The agreement uh, that Senator Sheldon was referring to with BSA provides that BSA is not liable for any claim the contractor may have against BSA for any cause of action, including breach of contract negligence or even a statutory claim. Are you aware that those kind of provisions exist within Contracts. Oh, I don't have visibility of the BSA and subcontractor agreement. So would you be aware that your subcontractors and the performance of NBN push all of their efficiencies, all of the um, productivity in this way down the line in terms of when things go wrong? It's the subcontractor that wears it. What kind of incentive do you believe this provides for your subcontractors who are working for primes to actually have that open dialogue with you where they can talk freely and honestly with you about what's actually going on. Is it any wonder that it comes up here through Senate estimates under privilege? They don't feel like they can talk to you. Uh, in the supply of service provisions, I want to ask you, um, what training is a delivery partner or prime required to offer in order to be satisfied that the technician it brings on board are actually able to supply services with the level of skill and expertise required? Because the BSA contract says the contractor must supply the services in a proper, timely, efficient manner using that standard of care, skill, diligence and prudence and foresight that would reasonably expect it of an expert, experienced provider of these services or similar services. Now that seems reasonable enough. That's the standard you'd expect, isn't it? Our contract with our delivery partners states the, uh, the scope of work and the types of work activities that we ask them to perform and the types of skills that we uh, need in order for those works to be performed. Do you think you could find those skills on Gumtree? Do you think you could find the, those skills where there's no formal contracting or employment agreement, how can, you, how, how can you opt in and say you've got the skills required if there's no formal contract or agreement? Uh, from our perspective with the delivery partner, we have what we call a, a platform called Enable. And what the contractor or the, the delivery partner does it uploads its technicians' details and all of their certification, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, dates of their certification and what technologies they've got the required capabilities to meet the uh, scope of works. They upload that into the systems, and that's how essentially okay. we're confident, and that's audited. That those type of things are audited, where we know that the a, a competent contractor is being provided uh, by the delivery partner to MBN to be able to perform the works. Does it include whether they're legally allowed to work in Australia? In that documentation, uh, that documentation would be with, from the delivery partner to the subcontractor. Uh, I, I would need to take that on notice to see. If we okay, so you that. don't see those skills or qualifications. We see the certification that the delivery partner has certified to us of that. The, the, the oh, work. the delivery partner yeah, certified right. it to you. Mm -hmm. Who certifies the delivery partner's work? Uh, in terms of the outcome of the work? In terms of the qualifications of the employees? Well, we do that in a quality, from a quality lens where we audit the work um, in terms of the work completed. We uh, have a strong health but and safety. You don't audit the qualifications themselves? I, I would need to go and look at the actual uh, detail of do we capture the evidence of the certification of that tech, but there is a, a governance, if you like, of the certification, but do they actually provide a certificate? I would need to check that. Yeah, I'd like you to check that, please. Can I ask who conducts accreditation training? Well, that will depend on the accreditation that is, you know... Okay. So I'd like very clearly for you to take on notice what accreditation processes exist for technicians to be qualified to work on the NBN 
and what oversight and governance processes exist to ensure those accreditation processes are sufficient. What I want you to be able to demonstrate is that the accreditation, that, that you haven't got unqualified workers or workers with fewer qualifications displacing workers who are properly accredited. Is NBN aware of third parties who list advertisements on Facebook Marketplace selling NBN enable accreditations for $100? No, I'm not aware of that. So you wouldn't be aware if any of those accreditations no, not, appear I'm, in your audited process? No, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of the Facebook post. Okay. Well, I, I guess it's a given that if the um, data that you know you've audited from your primes uh, about their accreditation, would they be aware? Would you be aware if any of those accreditations had been bought on Facebook? Uh, when we come back to you on our process and the verification of the process, uh, will I can answer that question? Comments. Questions we have, because I'd just like to call a short suspension to discuss between NBN and the committee just the implications. You might as well call the suspension the now. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yes, just just for the record, because of the unfolding situation in Melbourne and issues with witnesses from Melbourne, uh, we just need to understand what the constraints are uh, in terms of how we deal with remaining questions. So, if we could suspend, please, for the moment. Situation. I'm very grateful for those that having travelled, including you, Ms. Dyer, uh, and uh, we will seek to expedite our questions as best we can. Um, I'd like now to um, 
look at some of the uh, information that we've received from NBN technicians. A quote from one of them says, Primes are a major issue, it affects all of us. Prime and delivery partner favourites corner the market between themselves, essentially controlling who continues to work and who gets an in on a new contract. They don't care about our rates as much because they want to be in a close relationship with the delivery partner. As long as they can keep boarding X number of techs, it's all good to them, which means experienced people leave the industry over time. It affects working on the network. It affects us working on the network and the quality of workmanship, which further creates problems. I know of Prime sending guys straight after basic certificates to do the job. How's that even possible? Mr. Rue, can I ask you if you're able to comment on that industry dynamic that's pushing out experienced technicians and small business contractors? I might ask customers to do that. Yep. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of points there. The first point is, um, and I do need to acknowledge, and I think a lot of the interest in uh, in the NBN at the moment is we do have reduced work. So if I think back to 12 months ago where we were activating more than 30,000 premises a week, uh, now uh, the, the primary build is complete, the bulk of the first connects or the uh, connection activations um, you know, are largely done and now we're completing anywhere between seven to 10,000 customers a week. So yeah. just by the definition of that, there is absolutely less work. So does that mean you dismiss the idea that primes uh, and delivery partners are boarding X number of techs that are inexperienced? You, you still haven't really commented on the fact that I would have thought that you would be wanting to, in this rollout phase, where we're still talking about the reliability of the system, encourage your primes to keep experienced techs. Mm. So uh, in terms of our agreement with our delivery partners, it's very ba much based on supporting a great customer experience. So we look at the, the quality of the work done. We look at, was it right first time? Was it delivered on time? Uh, so we look at the quality metrics of that. So our expectation of our delivery partners is they are providing us with the right uh, technicians with the right capabilities at the right time. So that is our expectation of our contract. Well, I'm not sure that it's partners. the consumer experience, but um, in all cases. But um, can I ask, is it the net effect of dodgy contracts, rate reductions, and indeed cartel-like behaviour to push out experienced technicians and replace them with less experienced technicians? You know, would you expect that the work is complicated enough that you are sending an experienced technician is better than sending one who's newly qualified or are you you don't care? Our focus is very much on our contract with our delivery partner okay. providing the right outcome for MBN and we do uh, do in-field quality inspections, we inspect the work that is performed uh, so that's our expectation of our delivery partner. Okay. So at which point do you see, so if you've got a dodgy contract, rate reductions, inexperienced technicians, but if, uh, if the prime's not happy, and they don't, they, they don't even know yet, you don't even know yet that you're not happy because actually the technician that made the mistake because they didn't have the experience has already been replaced with another inexperienced technician. It just gives ongoing leverage to refuse to pay for jobs because quality standards ha weren't met first time. How would you know how many times a technician has to visit before your quality standard is met. Is that something you track? Yep, um, it is. And um, actually, Senator Kitching, I had a sort of another update for her on an item she was talking about uh, this morning. So to give you a data point, um, Senator Kitching asked me last time about uh, <coughs> the number of technician visits to complete work. So this could be a, a good a good reference point for you. So in financial year 21 until January 20, uh, Jan 21, um, we connected 1.4 to 6 million customers um, and 763,000 of those, i.e. 54 per cent, uh, required zero attendance, i.e. they're what we call a logical connection. So we're able to connect them remotely. 
So to give you the next point, so since January to April 21, we connected a further almost 700,000 customers, requiring 460,000 uh, 460, of those required, required zero attendance. So that's an improvement of 12%. Now, that might be counterintuitive to what you said about um, um, the reason I'm zero attendance that, means that the infrastructure was already there. Yeah, it was logical. So that's great yeah. from a customer experience point of view. So they've literally had no interaction with anyone other than their retail service provider. But you can see but clearly they're not the cases that we're talking about here, uh, Ms. Dyer, because um, you know I find it very concerning that when you're trying to refute what I'm saying, that you led with an example where a contractor was never even required. So our orders requiring two or less attendants, so this is where we do send a technician, has improved from 99.3%, so if you uh, to 99.5% from January to April. So again, uh, you know, so of those, and and how do you know in each of those cases that a prime Pratt, didn't send a contract order, twice? Order, Senator Pratt. Ms. Dwyer, I was directly answering your question. I understand. Please, please let her give that. I want to time. know if uh, my question is whether how you know that primes are properly reporting the number of visits that they've made to because a particular premises. Surely, all you care about is when they say the job's complete. Yeah, uh, I assure you, the delivery partner would tell us if there was more than one appointment because they would uh, make a claim for that with the MBN. They would give us a reason code and say. You know, we required a new leading conduit, or you know, there was something else. So they would notify us because, in fact, it's in theirs and uh, their interest to do that. Senator Except Pratt, if it was uh, their fault because they sent someone unqualified to do it. Senator Pratt, with uh, would you know under now those circumstances? The, Senator Pratt, order. Senator Pratt. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm listening. Um, we are now. 12 minutes over the lunch break. I thought you only had a couple of questions. Could you finish up with this one and then we will return uh, after the lunch break. Under dispute resolution, under its own contract, BSA can, without having to provide its case, withhold any payment where it disputes an invoice and a contractor must invoke the dispute settlement provisions to hope to recover some portion of the disputed invoice. On the other hand, BSA can merely because it claims to be owed money by a contractor, set that amount off against monies owed to the contractor, again requiring the contractor to engage in the disputes process to attempt to recover some portion of the monies. What disincentives do you consider that might create for technicians and small businesses to com raise complaints or invoke dispute resolution processes for unpaid monies? And I can certainly see how that dynamic might mean that not every visit to a site is recorded in the systems that you have oversight of. Uh, so our agreement is with the delivery partner who has an agreement with the subcontractor <coughs> and it's our expectation that the delivery partner is complying okay. with the law. All right, so in that context, you do not consider whether the contract with the prime uh, and the subcontractor, whether whether there are dis disincentives embedded in the contract are irrelevant to NBN Co. Well, our, the terms of our contract serve NBN in terms of the quality of the work, the timeliness of the work, you know, the safety of the work performed. That is what we engage with with our okay. delivery partner on. Are you aware that some primes have been employing workers without uh, that worker having signed any contract at all? I, I wouldn't have. I, I don't have visibility of that. Okay, Senator Pratt, I'm going to pull okay. you up there. We're Thank going you. to break for lunch. We'll return at 1.30. Page 20.